do this impact report without brownies. So I want you to start, if you even remember how the show started, and I'm going to do yet another investigation. You've got to be kidding me. No. I don't have any notes. <laughs> well, that's why I asked if you remember how it started. There was a lot of video of Hogan. It was Wolfie McGee in the cage. There was a cage in the ring, and Wolfie McGee was in the cage. Uh, he was cutting it. This is going to be a fucking disaster. This is going to set all new standards for shitty radio. So, Wolfie McGee was inside a steel cage. He was talking about how Angle claimed to have beaten him, and Wolfie said, yes, you got a victory after you applied an illegal submission hold, but it's not my definition of, of beating someone. To beat someone, you must beat them mentally and physically. And to make a long story short, he announced that at final resolution... They were going to have a match called Three Degrees of Pain. It would be a two out of three falls match, where the first fall would be a pinfall only, second fall would be submission only, third fall would be inside a steel cage. This announcement, I swear, got... No, they're all in a cage. They're three, they're all in a cage. All in a cage. I mean, the third one was escape the cage. Yeah, you have, to, you have to beat the man, or you have to pin the man, or submit the man, and then you have to run from the man. <laughs> yes, and... and and first of all, he made this announcement, and it was met with a round of lukewarm courtesy applause. Yeah. People do not care about this three degrees of pain match. And then, Nigel said, quote, despite the rules, he was going to win all three falls. <laughs> so apparently he was going to pin Angle, then submit him, and then I guess just go over the top of the cage. I guess you could do that. Sure. All right. So he called out Angle. Angle obliged. Came down to the ring. Got there. Find out Nigel had locked the door. So he climbed over the cage, attacked Nigel. So actually, I was I was in the kitchen at this point. Mm-hmm. Let me get this straight. Yeah. He called out Kurt, but then the doors locked. Well, he locked it. He had a key. He had a key and a chain. So why did he call him out and then lock the door? Well, in theory, it was a trap, you see, because he actually I had see. he had brass knuckles and he surprised Kurt with these brass knuckles. I see. And you think, okay, now he's got him locked in the cage, and they will do the bit where people run down, but they can't get in because it's locked. I get this. No, you, this would be foolish of you. So he threw him in the cage a few times, and he unlocked the door and he left. <laughs> yeah. Why lock it? Why not just have Kurt come in, attack you, and then hit him with the knuckles? I just like that he, he hit him with brass knuckles and knocked him completely unconscious. And then they still made him throw Kurt Angle into the cage repeatedly. <laughs> Knocking him unconscious was not enough. So anyway, he left, and people chanted the Yuri Wanker, presumably the writers of this show. Son Foley is going nuts backstage about how he can't get a hold of Dixie. And Angle storms in, and he says, Screw Final Resolution, I want Wolf tonight! So Foley's all downtrodden, and he's talking about how uh, he didn't know what his role was in TNA anymore. And uh, so he's talking, and this and that, and... uh, I lost my train of thought. Brownies have entered the room. I got some brownies. Should we try the brownies? Let's try the brownies. All right. They're very gooey. They are. They are. And very warm. <laughs> like a... Oh, my God. Oh, mm. yeah. Oh, win. Me okay. win. All right. Now mm. I can Now I can review this show. Actually, that may not be good for me. Every time something bad happens, you'll take a bite of brownie. That is incredibly sugary. Yes. Also fat. Wow. We're, not supposed, to, my favorite we're not supposed to chew on the air. Who oh, cares about this thing? Sorry, everyone. I'll try not to chew on the air after I get this. Um... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> you are annoying, actually, when you chew on the air. <laughs> God, I, I at least sound sensual. I What? <laughs> no. 40% of our audience is female. <laughs> oh, that's WWE. Remember? And a lie. There was one time where uh, we had been out gallivanting, and you had partied. You had overshot your target. Not like you did in Halloween. But you uh, could not get out of the car when I stopped wherever I stopped to get some food. And then I sat in the car eating for a while. And then you pointed out how disgusting it is when I eat. Oh, God, Yes. <laughs> Because it's like you shut off the car, and it's like really quiet, and I'm fucked up as it is. And uh, I know people hate this, but I'm yeah. gonna kind of recreate this. You were just like, and I was like, 
I am in hell. <laughs> the only, I, I have to be in hell right now. The There's only, no possible other explanation for this. I feel horrible. I feel dead. And this is what I'm going to hear for eternity. That's when I turned over a new leaf. The only time I am more disgusting than when I'm eating is when I first wake up in the morning. I don't believe that. You've seen me both. And oh. I, at least I don't have to see you. I see. I had to hear you. <laughs> disgusting. Just disgusting. Yeah. Anyway, what were we talking about here? Oh, Angle uh, comes in and Foley's all downtrodden, doesn't know his role is in TNA, and Angle said, listen, if you don't book me with Wolfie McWolferson, I'm going to book it. So this is this is the stuff that I hate about the TNA the most. Angle, if, if Angle can just book his own matches, why not just book the fucking match? Why do you go in and ask permission and then say, if I don't get permission, I'll do it myself? Who gave Angle this power? So Foley's like, no, 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 I'll do it. As long as you tell me what you know about Hogan. And Kurt said, listen, if I've said it once, I've said it a million times. I know nothing about Hulk. Foley, you are clearly just jealous. He pointed out that Foley was obsessed with Hogan. That's all he wanted to talk about, even though he had a big match coming up in two weeks. Never specified what the big match was. But he has a point. Foley, I happen to, be, because I am forced to watch this show, I'm aware Foley does have a match coming up. He's more t- obsessed with Hulk Hogan. Actually, I have no idea what Foley's match is. Mick Foley, at the pay-per-view. Oh, no. I believe it was a tag match, but I'm not sure. But I think he's wrestling Raven and Stevie in revenge for burning him and hanging him. But he's more upset about Hulk Hogan. You know, I think that is correct. Because I remember when I read the spoilers... And I read that the main event was Kurt Angle beating Raven and Stevie in a two-on-one match. I thought, that's the fucking dumbest thing I've ever heard of. But then when this match actually took place tonight, it didn't seem so dumb because I couldn't remember who they were facing. Now you alert me, it's it's uh, Foley. This is dumb. Alex Shelley and Doug Williams. The ref sent Magnus and Big Rob to the back. And Steven. Huh? Saban was also sent I'm not back. there yet. Magnus on the way back punched Chris Saban. Ah, that's right. I forgot. So then we had uh, this match. It was very good. Shelley is leaned up quite a bit. Looks great. Russell's great as always, as, of course, does Doug Williams. And made a comeback, hit the super kick, sliced bread for the pin, one, two, three. And uh, it was great. Yeah, they had two Pro men. wrestling on impact is a win. Every time. And, and we had the show last week, which is almost all wrestling. We loved it. And this show, there was some wackiness, but then they had a match. They got a decent amount of time between two talented guys who worked hard, and it was a, a, a man versus man contest with a clean finish. That's what we want. Thumbs up, Impact. The Pope met with Suicide, and he asked him to be partners with him in an eight man match at the pay per view. And Suicide said, Listen, I hate the Suicide voice, by the way. It appalls me. He's like, your other partners may trust you, but my trust comes with a higher price. And so Pope gave him a signed piece of wood. He explained in one of their battles, Suicide had had dived off a stage and put him through a table. And he kept that table to remember what a warrior Suicide was. But now, to show him trust, he was returning it to him. And he handed it to him, and he had autographed it and done a portrait. There's a little drawing on the side. Foley met with D. Lo Brown. D. Lo Brown, everyone. Why was he on impact? Has it ever a single time? Have we ever been alerted that D. Lo Brown is an agent in TNA? No. Is he? Of, I think. I don't. I, I have no other idea why he would be here. I'm pretty sure he's an agent. He did so keep saying him for the fact that there were two low blows on the same fucking TV show. He did keep saying he had work to do, and I thought, what would that be? Yeah, filling out job applications. I don't it know. certainly isn't booking good finishes on but this program. Th- th- there was this was actually the second time on the show they'd done the same thing. But Foley is standing there, and he just calls him D'Lo. Yeah, and they keep talking like this is a regular character. Yeah, D'Lo Brown was known as a pro wrestler in like 2000. <laughs> well, yeah, come back here this one. He's shown up once in a while, but you he think- was on Raw just a while back. He had like one match. Yeah. Do you think these fans in the Impact Zone, a large majority of them, knew who D. Lo Brown was? Actually, these fans, yes. Well, perhaps you were right, but I, I just I'm mystified they called him D. Lo. And then earlier on the show, this is, this is during the Angle Foley segment, Foley was worried Hogan would be bringing in knobs and beefcake. Mm-hmm. 
When was the last time Brutus Beefcake was a prominent pro wrestler? Everything, well, this about a week ago. When? Australia. In, okay. <sighs> I'll try this again. When was the last time, for the average Impact fan, Brutus Beefcake was a prominent pro wrestler? Well, under that name in the early 90s. Thank you. All right. It's been 15 to 20 years. They're referring out names like Beefcake and Knobs, like everyone knows who they are. Of course. Fools! So, he's talking to D'Lo, and he wants to know about Hogan. And D'Lo said, listen, I'm busy. I can tell you this. Hogan is a great guy. Word on the street is that Dixie brought in Hogan for one reason, and one reason only. To help TNA. Word on the street. No shit. Men were meeting in shadowy, shadowed alleys and exchanging rumors. And this was a rumor they came up with. <laughs> she brought him in to help the company. Swear to God, help it. She's not bringing him in to destroy this place. That is word on the street. That was something else. This show really does suck sometimes. So Foley pitched a fit, yelled and screamed, and then screamed at D'Lo that... I'm trying to get the exact line. Hogan isn't going to help you win the European title back. I swear he said that. Yes, he referenced Hogan the European title. Hogan is not title. going to help you win the European title back. Again, that was like... If I know, Angle won it in like 2000. So I, Deal was the one in like 98. This was like the moment where I just thought, God bless McFoley, I like the guy, but why don't you just go back to WWE now? What are you waiting for? I don't know. Why not just get it over with and go back to what you clearly feel is the number one company in the world? So that was that segment. And then we had Homicide against Suicide. And as you've mentioned before, why didn't Homicide just kill him and they'll both be happy? I don't know. They have a match. They don't work well together at all. <laughs> it was, I like both these guys, but yes, this was like, what are you doing? And then we had another awesome TNA moment. These are the moments that, again, this is why I hate Impact, everybody. So we have the match, and... Suicide wins clean with a backslide. Homicide, of course, immediately attacks him. So, like, two minutes later, you don't even remember who won. So what was the point of a finish at all? But So anyway, Homicide is attacking him, and he's threatening to tear off his mask. And I just thought, why don't you just take the mic and tell the world who he is? <laughs> because it's already been established that you know who it is. So... Why are you trying to tear off the mask? Why are you going to all this trouble? Why not just say, I know who suicide is. It's Frankie fucking Kazarian. Hello, everybody. So he's tearing off the mask and this and that. And the Pope ran down and made the save. That's my favorite part of the show, actually. He was saved by the Pope. Yeah. His savior came in the form of the Pope. Well, the Pope should. Uh, I agree. Yeah. So Pope, by the way, we should point out here, he's always the best dressed man on the show. But this week in particular... With his jeweled do rag, and I can't even describe this white vest he had, but it ruled. He is amazing. He is a great man. Daniels ran into the beautiful people, wanted to have a talk with him. I'll bet he did. They plugged the card for the night, which, by the way, was in fact 39 minutes into the show. They said, This is what you're going to see tonight on Impact. We had trash talk with ODB. What a garbage? Wretched. What? A wretched segment this was. Her guest was Tara, who she called Tara. And they started out by talking about, yes, WWE. Sure. Those exact words. WWE. ODB says, I don't care that you came from WWE. You can't just walk in here and sleep your way to the top. Tara's acting all confused. And then she starts crying. Tara is shedding tears and saying, I had two years left on my WWE deal, and I broke that contract to come to TNA, weeping, crocodile tears. She said WWE made her a laughing stock. It was humiliating, and she came here with all respect for the TNA girls. And ODB stands up and says, listen, I'm sorry about all that. We're going to have a great match at the pay-per-view. And then she punched her, leaped on top of her. Mysterious men came out and pulled her off. This was not even men in security outfits. They were just strange men. They looked like, I can't even say TNA fans. They looked like homeless fans that couldn't even pay the no money to get into the building. They drag ODB off, and Tara, Tara ran then, away sobbing. She proceeds to begin running away. She ran offset 
crying. Let's She's just, the baby face, the everyone. She's the baby face challenger to the champion who, under, I can't even, I can't call it harassment, an accusation that she had gotten things easy and then one physical attack had been reduced to a puddle of tears. They're going to have a championship match on pay-per-view. Yeah. This has sucked. And by the way, this is not why the segment sucked. It had nothing to do with why the segment sucked, but she was talking about how she was humiliated being a laughing stock towards the end of her WWE run. I vividly remember Victoria in the banana costume. That woman was not humiliated. That woman knew she was being funny and was having the time of her life with it. And it was awesome. I was actually trying to remember the humiliation that she suffered at the end. Because obviously they didn't tell us. They did not tell us. They, they they would do things where, like, she'd be in a dance contest and would fall down. That was WWE's idea of humor. You know, Ichiban of all people... The more I think about this, the more upset I am about this being the pinnacle of my life, talking about this shit. Ichiban of all people... Hey, at least you're talking about it. At least you didn't fucking write it. I don't think anyone did. <laughs> people did. People take pride in this, Vince. No. People title this show. <laughs> they get a fucking title. Listen, Perhaps they said, will you pay me 10 extra bucks to think of a title? And they said yes, and so the person did. Ichiban on our board. I don't even know why I'm even addressing this, because I'm, I'm sure he was trolling. But he, he did at least have a, a somewhat valid point. On the show the other day, I was in the middle of asking Dave about the comments that Bret Hart had made about Molina. And as I was speaking, I was like, what did I say? I, was, I actually had the, I put the transcript on the board. But basically, as I was beginning to ask the question, Dave jumped in to finish my thought, and then he made a statement, and I responded to him. And the next thing you know, we're just discussing it. And nobody ever bothered to, to alert the listeners as to what it was that Bret Hart had actually said about Molina. And so... Ichiban pitches a fit on the board, and other people are jumping in, and they're they're saying, God, Brian, you always complain about TNA doing this, and here you are doing it, and this, that, and the other thing. This is what you people don't get. Yes, that happened. Yes, I should have explained what it was that Bret Hart said about Molina, which was, by the way, that he thought she was the best wrestler in the world. Yes, I should have said that. Yes, something happened as we were discussing it, and it never got mentioned, fine. It was one time on the show. We have been reviewing Impact. We are not even an hour into the show, and I cannot even tell you how many incidents already on this show they have not bothered explaining. This is not one time during the show. This is not once every three or four shows this happens. This happens multiple times on every fucking impact. At least a half dozen times a week. Oh, yeah. Without question. I spent your entire rant eating brownie. It was awesome. Not to mention the fact that... Oh, Jesus. Jesse Neal's mohawk against the Pope. At least Neal is no longer a Navy guy with this ridiculous mohawk, which actually is... I like it because he's distinctive with it. That's true. Sure. So, this was Jesse's first match... If you recall, if you've been listening to this show or watching Impact, Jesse Neal turns heel, Team 3D and whoever the other guy was, Rhino and Jesse Neal, all did that promo backstage. It was such an awesome old-school heel promo. They introduced Jesse Neal as the future of the company. This is his first match as the new Jesse Neal. And three guesses what happened here. And if you watch Impact at all, you should only need one. Did the Pope pin him clean? Yes, of well, course. Of course he did. The Pope beat Jesse Neal clean in Jesse Neal's debut under his new gimmick. Then, of course, Jesse Neal had to attack him afterwards to get his no heat back. And suicide hit the ring and made the save. And so then they shook hands, and I guess they are going to be a team. They're going to be Three part weeks of, a... of angles in uh, 30 minutes. They're going to be an eight-man team. It's, it's Jesse Neal, Rhino, and 3D. I guess Hernandez, Morgan, Pope, and Suicide. I cannot believe you remembered that, but congratulations. Well, it actually worked because these two guys, they had had the promo earlier, and then Pope had saved Suicide, and now Suicide had saved Pope. But then all four heels came out to square him off. They kind of stood back-to-back. Back. They were outnumbered. Then Hernandez and Morgan ran down. People were jumping up and down for this. I don't know if they're specific fans of Hernandez or specific fans of Morgan, but they all were wearing matching shirts, so I assume it's one of their shirts. But people were so stoked for this. And uh, the, the, the baby faces ran down to even the odds, and once the odds were even, the heels ran away. It was the rare moment of logic on the show. 
and everything was fine. So it, it was too fast. It could have been stretched out over a month or more, but for what it was, it worked. Beer Money and Kevin Nash, or Beer Money versus Kevin Nash and Eric Young, there was yet another incident where Storm runs roughshod on Nash, and the announcer said, Payback for Turning Point! I have no memory of Turning Point. Not a single memory. I have no idea what Kevin Nash did to, La- to uh, James Storm. No idea at all. And, of course, they didn't bother to tell us. So, heat on Rude, and Storm gets hot tag. Nash and Rude end up outside. Nash grabs Storm's leg. Eric hits a low blow. Hits the dreaded Martinet for the pin. And as soon as the match ended, out came Foley. He demands Nash tell him all the news about Hogan and who he is bringing with him. So they banter back and forth here for a while. And uh, anyway, I don't even know... I don't even know what what transpired here. Something about Nash saying, I need to go put the band back together. Really, we need X-Pac and Scott Hall here in 2009? Sure. I don't know. Um, yeah, the, the match was good. Um, Kevin Nash was doing his best. He took a bump and everything. Very impressive. They were talking about how they were comparing Nash and Eric Young to Nash and Shawn Michaels. And they were talking about how Nash had brought something special out of Shawn Michaels. Really? Shawn Michaels is great because he hung out with Kevin Nash. Is that how it happened? Yeah. I see. Yeah. That thought never occurred to me. So I've been educated this evening. Thank you, Mike Nantaz. So, yes, and, and then Foley and Nash talked back and forth for a while, and nothing was established, and nothing was settled, and they left. They went to commercial. Mm-hmm. I, I, I don't know. I, they... they I guess Nash is form- reforming the NWO. I don't know. No one can care. The Nash World Order. Sure. And then we had Lashley and his wife come out. They were dressed like stars. They came down to the ring and looked like superstars. Mm-hmm. They looked like people who had made a lot of money in the wrestling business and were living the good life. Is it that hard? <laughs> Apparently not. You know, what's funny is, like... Uh, I guess most everybody. Well, it's kind of funny when you think about it. I was going to say the WWE guys, but uh, Angle actually Angle always shows up in a suit as well. When you see him, when he's in this, yeah. The 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 former WWE guys actually show up on TV dressed like stars, and the TNA homegrown guys, AJ Styles, Samoa Joe, oh. these are the guys that show up like they just got done surfing, or surfing the web. Or playing Guitar Hero. Or hanging out at the arcade. At the arcade. Yeah, and playing mini golf. Put some fucking nice clothes on, for Christ's sake. Well, it, it is funny, though, that they came out well-dressed by people who had had success. And here was where Chris and Marshall started plugging the seeds of Bobby Lashley as MMA versus TNA. Because she said that, she's talking about Steiner, she said she had never been harassed by perverts at an MMA event. Yeah. And then she said uh, anyone who bothered her would have to deal with Lashley because when I bark, this man bites. Kinky. I suppose it is. I have seen worse promos. It was a hell of a promo, actually. I like Crystal. Apparently, at least in the Observer, it said that Crystal is going to be turning heel and Lashley will be turning baby first, remaining babyface. Please explain. Bad, bad news. Please bad idea. explain. How? Of course, actually. Why not? Why not? Why fucking not? So, then we had Abyss versus Daniels. AJ was doing commentary. Asked Sting to please give him a call because he hadn't heard from him. So, Daniels and Abyss do this match. And Abyss makes a comeback. The place goes nuts. Sets up for the choke slam. And Daniels makes a signal. He like points one finger back and forth. Suddenly on the big screen, the beautiful people are attacking Lauren in the bathroom. So, Abyss is distracted. And we get yet another low blow... Followed by, not a schoolboy this time, a side roll. Sure. Again, I guess, why not? Aside from the fact that Chris Daniels is small and Abyss is enormous, and that was the fakest looking finisher I've ever seen, Chris Daniels pinned Abyss with a side roll. Abyss could not escape for the count of three. A side roll. Whoever's idea this was, just... I don't know. 
So that was a ridiculous finish, but I, I like the rest of the match. I thought the rest of the match was actually really fun. Sure. It was I, really fun. I, I, we all hardly ever knock the wrestlers themselves. No. But again, and this is actually WWE did the same thing. You have a guy contending for the the world championship on your next pay-per-view. He cannot get a clean win. Yeah. You had to protect Abyss. But at least he got like a, Abyss has never been pinned before. A powerful side roll. He has a side roll of doom. So Daniels dared AJ to hit the ring, but then the hooded guy came out and jumped him from behind. And uh, I'll get to AJ in a second. First, we got the Dixie interview. The second it started, we lost audio. I swear to God. I don't know if this happened all over the country or just here at Comcast, but we missed two minutes of her interview. We just, the, it's me and Dixie on her couch. Moving their lips, and we got no noise. No. Which actually... <laughs> yes. That was a better interview, <laughs> to be honest with you. I, I, it did... I, I was thinking, we should make up what they're saying and reenact this. No, I just thought that that's basically what she was saying. She was opening her mouth, and nothing was coming well, out. Well, that is true. Because when we got noise, it seemed like some... It, she said nothing of any substance at all. No, she, she actually had, did. Dixie Carter actually said... She was asked about Hulk Hogan, and she said that, well, you know, we need we need greater awareness for our product, and Hulk is going to bring it to us. And then she said, I have never known Hulk Hogan to be in such a great place. Hmm. I have never known Hulk Hogan to be in such a great place. In his life? Dixie, clearly you didn't read his book, but have you turned on the fucking television? He's you had clips of him on Larry fucking King. You've never known Hulk Hogan to be in a better place. He's never been in a worse place, admittedly. His wife stole light fixtures out of his fucking house, or vice versa. This is the bottom of his life. He's broke. He's got no money. He's going to have even less money next year when this lawsuit goes through. This is the worst bottom-of-the-barrel moment in the life of Hulk Hogan. I heard that, and I was gobsmacked. Well, she's stupid. <sighs> she said in the next couple of days, we know how serious TNA was about taking it to the next level. Great. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. Apparently after I uh, let me I'll just I'll just tell this exactly how it how it occurred. So I go on the website, my own website by the way, and there's a headline story and it says uh it says Carter announces second TNA show. Literally urine almost came out of my penis. I'm not gonna lie to you. I clicked on it. Hands shaking, hair starting to stand up on the back of my neck. I was like, no, God, no. So I click on it, and it reads, in an interview on the TNA website posted after Impact, Dixie Carter mentioned a second show, a compilation show of tapes from the video library called TNA Epics. It'll debut in January on Spike TV. And the wave of relief that washed over me. Indeed. So I was sitting there thinking, why don't I stop watching Impact and just watch TNA Epics. Great idea. Let me get this straight. It is nothing but a compilation of wrestling matches from the TNA library. Yes. That sounds like the best show of all time. <laughs> no angles. No, no interviews. No promos. No storylines. No. Just a bunch of fucking TNA matches. I would be the happiest man in the world. Let's do that. If they canceled Impact and all I had to watch every week was TNA Epics. Let's that cancel it here. I guarantee would be my favorite show in the whole wide world. I may do that. I see no reason not to. We may have TNA Epics. Jan Actually, we can't in January because Hogan's going to come in and we've got to see what happens. Well, okay, you got me there. But uh, if it's a complete disaster, which it may end up being, then we may just boycott TNA Impact and watch TNA Epics. And Move I've been promoting for years and years and years. For people who think that I, I hate TNA, think again. I hate Impact. I would love, love to watch TNA Epics every week and not have to watch Impact. You don't even know how happy I would be. 
Just cancel this fucking show. Or at least get some new writers that aren't complete imbeciles. You've been asking for that for years on this show. Yeah. It's never going to happen. It's got to at some point. It has to. I'm just amazed that, obviously, Dixie was not happy with how things were going. So, instead of firing the writing crew, which is like the logical answer to this question, she hired Hulk Hogan. Mind-boggling. Why do you think that woman knows what she's doing? Well, no, but, okay. I mean, he, wouldn't that, I mean... He, she he, likes the shows he's putting out. <sighs> she can't figure out horrible. why no one's watching it. She figures they need a bigger star. Oh, yeah. That's how she's thinking. Hmm. She thinks her television show is a great product that people aren't aware of. I told you that earlier, and you mocked me. I was repeating your own words back to you now. <laughs> to, to prove a point that you've forgotten, apparently. Let me prove a point Let's about Let's talk about impact. Impact. Hamada and Sarita. This match ruled. This match was awesome. This was the best women's match I have seen in I don't even know how long. A long-ass time. They, I mean, Hamada, of course... You know, perfect opponent for Sarita. Knows Lucha, can be a great base for her. Yes. I can watch these girls have a match every show for the rest of my life, probably. It was awesome, including Sarita taking a bump and managing to do a full head spin. She took a missile drop kick. She bumped back on top of her head, spun around, and rolled down to her back. Yeah. It's incredible. Amazing. So Hamada hit a bunch of kicks and then killed her with a Michinoku driver for the pin. I think they actually... I think the finish was supposed to be a cradle, but she leaned back too far, and, and uh, it didn't work, and they had to improvise this finish. I don't know, but regardless, this finisher, this, this match was awesome. This fucked up finish was better than most of the things they do on purpose. And then you know what they said? They said, Hamada has beaten both of the members of the championship women's title team in the last two weeks, thus setting up a championship match. I almost cried with joy. <laughs> This is professional wrestling. You would think. A girl beat the champions one at a time in two successive weeks, and now she'll get a partner and have a championship match. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, TNA. That was beautiful. Then we had a mad promo by AJ, and it's back to shitty impact. I don't know what it is about mad AJ I that does not work, going. but it just does not work. I'm very tired. Mad AJ Styles. It just... I don't buy a moment of it. I I don't know. Um, I was not blown away by it. I was no. not. I thought it was another AJ Styles promo. Like most things in the show, I tried to absorb as little of it as possible. Actually, you know what? This may have been when I was trying to get the computer to work. Yeah. So I may not even watch this at all. Angle came I out. Know what happened, but I have no recollection of it. And then Foley came out with a mic. Foley said, Kurt. He told Kurt he could have a match with Nigel if Kurt had told him everything he knew about Hogan, which he didn't think Kurt had done. And by the way, this Mick Foley Hulk Hogan thing, I'm so sick of. I mean, I was sick of it last week, and it just kept going here. You know, I was, it's funny. I was thinking, don't ask me why I was thinking about this. This is a long time ago. I was thinking about if Hulk Hogan came back, who could he work with? And I thought, you know, a Hulk Hogan and Mick Foley program would probably be pretty fun. Well, that's not happening. It's not coming out the way I thought it might. So, you know, we've always said it should be a drinking game where every time someone says the words, you see, in a promo, you drink. Foley not only said, you see, he said it three times in succession. It had to be a rib on me. So, he announces that Kurt's new opponents will, in fact, be Raven and Stevie Richards. Why would... Now that I'm thinking about this, if he's fighting Raven and... Stevie at the pay-per-view, why would he put them in a two-on-one match with Kurt Angle if he's mad at Kurt? Well, he explained this, actually. He, okay, please explain to me then. I wasn't paying attention. He said he, he's mad at Kurt for not telling him all about Hogan, allegedly. He's mad at Raven and Stevie for lighting him on fire and hanging him. <laughs> so these are equal in his mind. and So, so two-on-one is equal? Well... The way he put it was, either you, they will hurt you or you will hurt them. Either way, I win. So, yes. Okay, well, yeah, I guess so. In Foley's mind, in Foley's mind, he thought it was equal, and if it wasn't, he really didn't care. All right, I apologize. That actually does, in fact, make sense. So they double turn Team Kurt. He makes his own comeback, running all over the ring in the process. I don't even know why. Stevie got clotheslined outside, grabbed his hand and bailed. Out came Abyss, who gave him the lightest... Black hole slam ever on the ramp. Thank God. Yeah. I have no problem with that. Don't get me wrong. And then Kurt gave, uh, put Raven in the ankle lock for the submission. 
And then in another great TNA moment, remember like about two months ago, Desmond Wolf debuted and like he beat up Angle and left him laying. And then on the next show, he beat him up and left him laying. And then on the next show, he beat him up and left him laying. And it was like, is this not overkill? Well, the show ends with Desmond Wolf coming out and laying out Kurt Angle for the second time on the same fucking show. I can't make this stuff up. So there you go. Two weeks in a row. I mean, two, not even two weeks in a row. Twice on the same show. This was an impact where it was ended, and I thought, boy, that was almost as good as last week. And you know what? I was wrong. Last week was so much last better. Last week was so much better. This was still better than most impacts. It had a lot of good stuff on it. It yeah. had a lot of shit. It had a lot of wrestling, which was good. It was good. The rest of it was horrendous. I feel... Am I Groundhog Day? <laughs> the Murray movie where he wakes up is the same thing every day. I just wonder if, like, Dixie Carter would ever listen to this show and just get so mad at how mean we are, as opposed to actually just listening to what we said. I mean, could I possibly be more fair? I love all the wrestling on this show. I hated all of the storytelling on this show, and I explained exactly why. I'm not just doing this to be mean. I've explained every single criticism I have had. I could not possibly be more fair. But they won't listen. Why do I even care? I don't even know. Because I want to watch TNA Epics. Because I want Hogan to come in just to see this shit show. See, that's why that's why I can't get understand people who are worried about Hogan. How can he make this show worse? Hulk Hogan, there's a bit in this show where he was doing a promo from his book tour, and he was talking about TNA, and he said, no one understands more than me about how this business works. And I thought, you know, that might be true. <laughs> that, actually, that may well be true. He may be right, actually. If he if he picks a guy, says, if he says, here is what made me a star, we will do the same thing with this person, and they do it, it'll work. Yeah. Yeah. And this, the, the dude's whole career is bad guy beats him up, he sells and makes the bad guy look like a killer, and then comes back and gets revenge. Yeah. Repeat. <laughs> it's not complicated. No, it really is not. In this fucking show, I don't even brownie. And he has, he has promised to get rid of the writers. And I hope that he... Hopefully physically. For the first time, stands by his word. I think Hulk Hogan, with a body falling apart and a fake kick, could still kill these men. To the back! This, uh, this was a, a poor program in a number of ways. Not the worst impact I've ever seen. I've said it before, but... Uh, Let's uh, get to work on this. I'll let you uh, get started. Show opened with Mick Foley meeting with Kevin Nash. Nash promised Foley. Oh, actually, you know what? Hold on a second. Why do I bother showing up sometimes? I just I, well, I was looking for a song while you were opening this up, and I just remember this email I got. I don't even want to mention the guy's name because I don't want him to get mad or embarrassed. But um, I'm just going to read this email because it it. Blows my mind. He writes, song for Brian and Vinny show. And he says, well, this isn't really a song. Because it is nearing the end of the year, I felt this would be relevant. It is a compilation of you being fooled by the song with the Benoit drop in it four times this year. It's only about three minutes long. It is quite funny. In what way would this be funny at all? This seriously boggles my mind. I don't want to hear that song. I really get mad every time I accidentally play that song again. Why would I want to hear a compilation of that song four times? Can anyone explain this to me? I, I could not believe this email when I got it. There are people... I don't ever want to hear this song again. Yeah. I don't find it funny at all. What is funny about a song where in the middle of it... We are alerted that Chris Benoit killed his wife and his family. The point what of this compilation, Brian, that? is not that the song is funny. It's people think your reaction to the song is funny. I don't want to hear it either. I I'm, just, I don't get it. I don't either. But, I mean, I, I understand that they think my reaction is funny, but someone, and not even just someone, I can't even blame this guy, because I'll bet a lot of people probably thought that I would want to play this show for laughs. I don't know. Play it on this show for laughs. I don't know. I don't want to, everybody. So let's not mess around with that one, because it's not funny. All right, go back. I apologize. So, Mick Foley, Mick Foley met with Kevin Nash. Nash promised Foley that he could arrange a face-to-face -face meeting with Hulk Hogan if, uh... Well, yeah, he said he could arrange a face-to-face -face meeting with Hulk Hogan. He had him a plane ticket. It was coach. It had two layovers. 
But he would get there, and, and, and Hogan had agreed to meet with him. He said, in exchange, I want to run Impact for the evening. And Foley said, that's fine. He said, I'm taking Borash with me. So apparently, Borash apparently now could just magically get this plane ticket to join Foley. They didn't, they didn't have to get online and go to Travelocity or anything to book this. He just went outside to go get his plane ticket to match Foley on this two, two layover cross country flight. Right before Foley left, he said, here, this is the footage of my meeting with Jarrett. This must be played on the show tonight. And he said, okay. And Foley and Borash left. And Nash picked up the phone. And he said, this is Nash. I'm in charge tonight. I want the security tapes of this office of the past three months. And then did there. And I just thought, someone answered the phone and said, you know, tape department. And they said, this is Nash. And the person said, yes. And Nash said, I'm in charge. And the guy said, all right. Did not ask for any proof of it, it surprises you in what way? It doesn't surprise me at all. It just made me laugh. Yeah, this segment was uh, very uh, long, and uh, it was interesting in the sense that they did all this stuff, and then it was immediately followed by Nash coming out and telling us exactly what we had just seen, which I guess is fine. At least they, they hammered it home for once. His first words upon getting in, in the ring were, Boy, are you guys in for a show tonight. Yeah. He almost, it was like he knew this was shit. Signed a bunch of the matches, people booed. It sounded like a train wreck. We had man versus woman matches, multi man matches, matches with chicks in mud, so on and so forth. And then he's like, since I never got my money back from my suspension, the main event is going to be a title shot with AJ versus the highest bidder. And again, what suspension? <laughs> what do people at home think when they watch this show and many, they hear about a suspension that many. Kevin Nash had? Never explained on television. There was never any incident that would have led to a suspension. He just continues to talk about this mystery suspension. There are many times on this show where it appeared to be I've written for yourself, your friend Dave, and your readers. To, to hate? To understand. Huh. No one else I can't... How many people watch this show every week? Why did Foley well, need a plane ticket from Orlando to Clearwater? With two layovers. Why did why did Borash leave without getting a plane ticket? I don't know. He was why was Borash excited because he was given a hundred dollars? Is he that poor? He's supposed to be a TV star. If I gave you a hundred dollars, you would react like that. Well, yeah, but I'm. It's not like I'm. Uh, this is TNA, where you're an announcer for TNA. You're you're one of the main players on the show, really, in a lot of ways. And this geek is excited for a hundred dollars. There are many many questions I have about this program. So. Then we had a Foley video playing. It was the first one that he'd given Nash earlier. And I am not not making up what happens here. He goes into a room, and in the room were the writers, including Vince Russo. He said, you guys are great writers, so why don't you write a vignette where Dixie returns my calls for once? He really said this. Yeah. This really happened on the air. Yes. What he basically said was, all the other vignettes they do are made up and fictional. And he announced this to the viewers at home. Then he runs into David Sahadi, the Darth Vader guy, and he's talking to him about where Jeff is, and Sahadi says he has no idea, and tells him where Jeff usually ate. This all aired on television, and Foley should be smarter than this. You would think. Uh, I, I thought this might be Sahadi. I didn't know for sure. I didn't know until right now you said this. Well, I presume he just called him David. He was just a guy Foley right. was talking to who apparently knew Jared very well. And uh, when Foley at some point said he could do anything without being fired, and then he started throwing the name, is, is it Gewurz? Around? It's something like that. He started throwing is that, that what he did? Yes. He started th throwing that guy's name out there. And I just wanted to know how many... Th there's what... So, one and a half million people watch this every week, roughly. Yeah. How many of those 1.5 million know who Brian Gewurz is? Maybe everyone that watches this show, for all I know. I find no. They certainly believe that. So who am I to argue? The answer is no one. Thank you. This was a horrendous, <laughs> horrendous television segment. Yeah. Chris Saban against all three of the British Invasion. 
They said Nash had banned Shelley from ringside. I was trying to figure out why Nash hated Chris Saban. I have no answer. Is there an answer somewhere that I forgot in the last couple of shows? I, I he used to be their anything. mentor. Yeah. That, 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 didn't he put the guns together at one point? I remember that, but I don't remember why he hates Chris Saban. I don't have anything. I presume part of this was because he wanted to help his friends the British invasion, but are there is there no one else that could have done a three-on-one match? So Saban wins. The uh, invasion fucked some stuff up. Then he pinned Rob with a tornado small package. Well, that was a cool move. Yeah. Place went nuts. It was fun, but the invasion looked like complete bumbling idiots, which if that's what you wanted, is this story you wanted to tell, good job. You were a success. Lance Storm once said that Vince Russo wanted all his heels to be stupid. Well, he succeeded. They were here. Good job. We had Christy, who was replacing Borash, interview Scott Steiner. Christy was all over this show. In WWE, they hire... Completely generic dorks to do the backstage interviews. And it always kind of annoyed me. But then after a while, it was like, I completely understand this now. Because you want your stars to look like stars. So the bigger geeks you can find to interview these guys, the more your stars will look like stars. Sure. Hence, you've got a dork like Todd Grisham. Right. You've got a dork like Josh Matthews. Uh Uh-huh. These dorks interview much taller, much more muscular, and much more tanned individuals, and they look even better. Meanwhile, TNA, every interviewer has to be like a centerpiece of the segment. Right. Christy is, is, you know, she's doing back and forth with Steiner. They're talking about all this. She's essentially trying to steal his thunder, like has happened many times with different interviewers in TNA. Uh It's all about her. And, yes, so Snyder buries her, he buried Crystal, he buried Lashley, and even threatened to beat up their one-and-a-half-year-old infant. And then he rushed off screen and says, I'll beat up anybody! He said, I don't discriminate based on age. And he walks off screen, and Chrissy started to close the segment or throw it in there or something, and Snyder screams, I'll beat anybody up! Yeah. Awesome. We had another bunch of skits with Foley. I have absolutely no idea what happened in this one. There was... He talked. He, he went to a diner, or he asked an old woman where Jarrett was. Yeah, that is all I could get out of this. This appeared to be Mick Foley auditioning to be the next host of Diners, Drive-ins, and Dives. Remember those, skits which would be awesome, by the way. Where Foley had amnesia. Yes. What did he write about those skits? Because I, I really hated them. Very much like those skits. Very much like them. I only vaguely recall the skits in question, but this they could not have been much worse than this. No. In fact, I bet if you go and look back, they were probably significantly better because standards have fallen greatly in the past 15 years. Bobby and Crystal Lashley against Scott Steiner and Kong. A note here. When Saban came out to face three grown men, he came out smiling. He uh-huh. came out happy. Yeah. He was not concerned at all. Oh. At all. And as we learned, why should he have been? Yes. Meanwhile, Crystal comes out. We don't even know who Scott Steiner's mystery diva is going to be. Could have been anybody. And she is selling like she is scared to death. I thought, huh. <laughs> Why does this girl know what she's doing and no one no else, one seems else to. on the show does? So Kong because ended Crystal up being Marfler the is, in fact, better than TNA. She, uh, she was out there on the apron. Lashley worked the whole match. She finally got sent into the steps. And, and Steiner scared Crystal into the ring. Crystal bonked into Kong. Kong gave her a chop. Crystal fell down. Kong went up top to do a Vader bomb or a moonsault or something, and Steiner just nonchalantly walks in. He lays on top of Crystal, pins her, and and then starts doing uh, lewd, humping-style push-ups on top of her, and uh, then bailed. So let's start here at the beginning. First off, what are the rules for these matches? It's man-on-woman violence. Is that allowed? I guess it is. But second, like... Are the rest of the tag rules not not followed? Why did why was Steiner able to just walk in? Was he legal? I don't know. What in the hell is going on I in this know. match? Right? Those may or may not be valid questions, but the fact is, I do not care. There was one other notable thing here, which was that when Bobby Lashley came to the ring, the people chanted his name. They were into Bobby Lashley. And I thought, how apropos... That the day he's finally over in the impact zone, he signs with Strike Force. Same fucking day. Huh. Just fabulous. Just fantastic. Anyway, this sucks. Lauren interviewed Samoa Joe. 
about the Feast of Fire Mass in the pay-per-view. He started to speak, and then Beer Money interrupted. He went back and forth for a bit, and Joe left. And then Beer Money said they were entering Feast and Fired because the British invasion had banned them from getting future, future title, banned them from getting future title matches. Therefore, the only way they could get one was to get the briefcase with the tag title shot in Feast of Fired. Therefore, it was worth risking losing their jobs for it. And I thought, holy shit! For the first time they've done one of these, it, they found a reason some of them be willing to risk losing their job to get a title shot. And what was that reason, Vince? Because there's no other way for these guys to get one. <laughs> okay, think about what you've just said. <laughs> Beer Money are never going to get a tag team title shot again in the history of their lives. That's what the step was. <laughs> Well, okay, there is the fact that huh. TNA has gone back on their own step for a second time in two months. Now, wait a second. It's just They just can't get a shot against the British Invasion, right? Or whoever's the champions? So what happens when they lose the belts? They, they, get, they get a shot against the Dudleys? I find that hard to believe. I still don't buy this. This right. is the stupidest stipulation of all time. This is even dumber than King of the Mountain. This oh. feast or fired bullshit. Just dumb. I... I, I, I I'm going to move on. All right. Beautiful people arguing backstage about this upcoming mud wrestling match. And uh, it's going to be Velvet versus Lacey. And they're upset to be humiliated. And Nash walks in and says, this is not about humiliating you. It's about ratings. Well, technically he said, I don't want him to humiliate you. This is about ratings. So the, the implication there was, I don't want to humiliate you, but I will if it leads to higher ratings. Which... Leads to Velvet asking the question that probably 1.5 million viewers asked, which was, who gives a fuck about the ratings? So Nash convinced them that I guess if they got the highest quarter hour of all time or something, they would get a lot of money. And Velvet was like, more cars, more clothes, more houses? Yes, I guess I guess it plays into the storyline, but she believed that this mud wrestling match would lead to her making enough money to buy houses. Right. Maybe houses are cheap in Florida. I don't know. Sure as shit aren't around here. This segment, well... It was no worse than a million other things on this show. Tara was angry backstage. She was... Oh, this segment. Who writes this shit? She's angry backstage... And she says she's humiliated because she has to drink before her hardcore match with ODB. Those are the steps. They're going to have a hardcore match, and both of them have to drink first. So, of course, my first thought is, why don't you just not drink? Why don't you pretend you drink? Why don't you lie? Why don't you have a sip and pour the rest down the toilet? I can think of a hundred solutions here. Tara cannot. Tara is, is crying, literally, that she has to do this match. So then, as she's bitching and whining and complaining about having a drink before the match, she then says, but you know what? I drink a whole keg to get in the ring with ODB. So what are you bitching about? This annoyed me. <laughs> You're not wrong. I just would just like to note that seven days ago, on this very program, Tar was complaining about her old job and how they made her a laughing stock. And so she came to TNA to be part of their knockout division where it was all about competition. Yeah. Seven days later, she's being upset because she's humiliated and being forced to drink a lot of beer. Yeah. Consistency. Then she walked off camera, and there was a loud thud, and she screamed. Comedy. Ha, 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 ha. Eric Young against Hamada. This actually was a fun match because Hamada beat the holy shit out of him for a minute and then went for a moonsault, missed, and got pinned. And they immediately cut away. There, there was a promo first where Eric Young was talking. I tried to pay attention, but it was impossible. He basically said he was going to try really hard in this match, and he wanted her to as well. Yeah, and it, it was fun while it lasted. It went like 90 seconds. Eric Young pinned her with his feet on the ropes. Yeehaw. So then the beautiful people were trying to decide how to get the highest ratings possible out of this skit. The highest ratings. Is there anybody that cares about ratings nowadays except Vince Russo? I guess Dixie. Do you think WWE really cares all that much about ratings? <laughs> well, that's a different argument. I mean, they do uh, to a degree, 
I mean, they don't want to see them drop to 2 9. There's little evidence lately that they care about business in any way. Every fucking single segment has to be highly rated. So they're talking about how to get the highest ratings, and they decide that uh, they'll take all their clothes off. Well, the, the, the first idea was a wardrobe malfunction. And I just thought, so you will accidentally expose skin, and this will boost ratings how? Well, people will magically know you're going to ma- the accidentally expose skin and all tune in by the thousands? Sure. That's not how it works, though. You don't do something cool and then magically that's highly rated. You promise something cool. Well, they just they did in this segment. I, I suppose they Let's did. Let's have a, mal- a wardrobe malfunction. They, 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 their agreement here was to finally kiss on live TV. Yeah. They didn't do it. ODB, Tara, Trailer Park, Hardcore Match. <laughs> this, this is prefaced by another Foley video. This time, he finally found Jeff Jarrett. He been he had That's flown right. to Nashville in search of this man, had, had had no luck, but was finally able to track him down. How? By getting lost, going into a random restaurant, and asking for directions, and Jeff was at the bar. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> so, that leads us to ODB and Tara in a trailer park hardcore match. I will just wrap this up by saying that ODB and Tara are fighting for the championship at the pay-per-view. And uh, to set that up, that singles wrestling match for the championship at the pay-per-view, they had a trailer park hardcore match for free on TV, which ODB won clean. Yeah. Mike Tanay actually said, this is almost a direct quote, when these two girls square off at the pay-per-view in a straight professional wrestling match, we'll see if there's a different outcome. I don't know. I I cannot make this up. The show... The show was like, it was so bad I couldn't get angry. I don't know. I, I don't know how to explain it. Cause this... They had a hardcore match that the champion won clean right. to set up the challenger getting a title shot in a straight match. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. I know. You're right. I Maybe I'm just even more apathetic towards the show than usual, but I watched this thinking, this is, not just a segment, but the show in general, I watched this thinking, this is bullshit, but I don't care. Yeah. Usually I see bullshit and I get angry. This time I just said, look, it sucks, and accepted it, and just shook my head and waited for the next shitty segment. So Foley and Jarrett have a talk. Foley says, listen, Jeff, you can't stay away from wrestling. And Jarrett says, it's true, Double J can't stay away, but Jeff Jarrett can. Well, who the fuck's Double J then? So his fake character made made by the writers, apparently. Hmm. I like where Jeff announced to the world, I've been living in hell. Yeah. <laughs> that sucks. Why? Well, well we, I'll we, tell you why. We he says, out. quote, after what she's done to me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they started grabbing another drink. So what did she do to him? Who's she? <laughs> well, presumably Dixie Carter. I guess so. This was a phantom Kevin Nash suspension angle right here. Rhino, Jesse Neal, Team 3D against Matt Morgan, the Pope, Suicide, and Hernandez. That was a scheduled match. Apparently, they beat up the Pope backstage. So, of all the people to take out of this match... They took the Pope out. They took out the Pope. So, I was shocked that Russo was smart enough to have it be three-on-four advantage heels. That was uh, uh, revolutionary, actually, in fact. So, of course, the uh, finish was Jesse Neal, who last week in his debut as a heel was pinned clean. This week, he pins Homicide. Why? No fucking idea. But he did, and so per some stipulation that I actually was not paying attention to, they get the man advantage in some sort of elimination match at the pay-per-view. Okay. I will start with the match itself. It was fun. It was short, but it was fun. Everyone did a good job. Jesse Neal, for having had like a half dozen matches, he is pretty good. He is a walking advertisement for the Team 3D Wrestling School. So thumbs up to everyone involved Unfortunately, in so was Team 3D. Well, there's that. <laughs> but... Here is the booking of this. Here is what is at stake. Due to being pinned here, Hernandez will start the elimination match at the pay-per-view one on four. And this, by the way, this is all... What? This is the best I could gather 
from what Nash mentioned at the beginning of the beginning of this show and what Snay and Taz threw back in a couple of one liners during this match. They are going to do a four on four survivor series match at the pay per view with these two teams, except Hernandez will start alone for five minutes. If he lasts five minutes, then I guess it's just a regular survivor series match. If he is pinned or submits in the first five minutes, the match is over and the heels win. This is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Why does it have to be that complicated? Why can't it just be an elimination match? Nobody, nobody. This this is one where I can actually say not even family members. Nobody on the earth could possibly care about this match and these stipulations. It's impossible. This show. You've got to be making these up. I swear to God. I swear on the earth. Nash announced the, in the promo, he listed 800 shitty matches, so I can see why you missed it. But he said there will be an eight-man tag, and the loser of the, the, the person who is pinned in that eight-man tag will start the elimination match at final resolution alone for five minutes. And I thought, what elimination match? When was this announced? I still have... I, I don't even know if there is an elimination match. I don't believe this. Maybe they've all already been eliminated. I think that this is all just some sort of... I'm actually... I had a moment just a second ago where I expected to wake up here in a second. I've never had that before doing this show. <laughs> it was a dream. But this this is just... this was That was so surreal for a moment that, that I actually thought I might be asleep right now. Wow. That's a stupid stipulation. So, we had a video package of Tomko working out. He's, He's strong. back, they noted. Taz and Tanae were out there in umbrellas for the mud wrestling match. And it was, in fact, a mud wrestling match. What can I say? They got in there. They rolled around. They fell down. They were laughing their asses off. They got covered in mud. They attacked the ref, who was Madison Rain, dragged her through the mud. Tanae screamed, three-way, repeatedly. Velvet, I guess, pinned her. And then they rolled around in the mud a lot more. They wore a bunch of skimpy clothes, which they had to make sure that they kept adjusting, because they were apparently showing more than they were comfortable with, which begs the question why they were wearing so little. And I will say that if this was a segment designed to garner ratings, I don't think it will. We'll see. Were they really any hotter here being covered in mud than they usually are just doing their entrance? You would think that they would want to not get in the mud for a while. But no, they went right into the mud. Especially because when they when they did step into the mud, from their reactions, it looked like the mud was cold. Yeah. And, well, why not? I don't know. They can't afford to heat mud. Where are you going to get warm mud, Vince? You know, I hadn't thought of that. How are you going to heat it? I don't of know. Of course it's colder than shit. Then we had Jay Lethal doing a wild interview. He's alive! His Lethal Invitational is returning next week. We have not seen him since he lost clean to Jim Neidhart. I assume Neidhart had eaten him. Spoilers! He's... Going to be beaten by Tatanka. I believe the last time we saw him, he was really fat, too. Yeah. More with Foley and Jarrett. This was the greatest segment of all time. Foley revealed that Jarrett had apparently told him that, quote, there was no safer investment you could make than investing in TNA. Uh huh. Ha 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 ha! You've got to be kidding me. I guess that's what Jeff said. And Foley was apparently stupid enough to believe him. It gets better. It does. Apparently, Foley has lost money because Hulk Hogan is coming to TNA. He said that investment had been flourishing until a few months ago. Yeah. Hulk Hogan coming to TNA. Cosmic Foley dollars. As an investor in the company. As an investor of the company. What a dumb shit. The business has gone Ooh, down. Right to this. CNA is less valuable now. Nobody could read this script and realize how fucking stupid this this is. Foley couldn't read it and think this. Jeff Jarrett. It's mind boggling. So Jarrett has by the way, it's also great. Jarrett's hair is bleached. But he's growing a wacky gray beard. So he's also wearing a blood rain skull cap. I just love that he can still afford to bleach his hair, but apparently he's, that's all he can afford to do, because he's... Because he's drinking at the bar all day. So they keep talking about this crime Jarrett had committed. I have no idea what the crime is. And uh, and finally, Foley gets mad, and he goes, Well, Jarrett, why don't you just cozy up to the bar 
And let someone else raise your two little girls. And Jared says, it's three. And then he says, pull up a chair, Mick. And he said, we got to talk. What are these 1.5 million people thinking? I have no idea. What could they possibly be thinking about this bullshit? Maybe they think they adopted a little girl named Gewurz. I don't know. I don't know. I was trying to tie back, but tie that back. You but failed. I just like that they were sitting there and talking, and then Jared said, sit down, we need to talk. Yeah. And then in the very next segment, they are best buds. Yeah. We'll we get missed. to that. We'll get to that. AJ and Desmond Wolf, Angle Dune commentary, said so he wanted to see this man who had outbid him. Yeah. So they have a great TV match. Desmond gives AJ a low blow, sets up for the lariat, and then Daniels comes down and distracts him, and AJ rolls him up for the pin. The best the announcers could come up with was that Daniels wanted to make sure that he was the guy who beat AJ. So Desmond goes after Daniels. They get in a brawl, setting up a match next week, which will be Desmond versus Daniels, even though the pay-per-view is AJ versus Daniels and Desmond versus Angle. How this all plays and everything, I have no earthly idea. So that was the main event. It was at least a good match. I can give that a thumbs up. Yes, there, there, there were there were two good matches in the show. So it was not the worst impact of all time. When this thing started, I realized there's a pay-per-view in 10 days. Cause I'm, I'm, it's Christmas. I'm busy this month. So I actually wrote down what was happening on the calendar. And I thought, there's a pay-per-view in 10 days. I think I can name one match. And by the end of this, I could name four. But I had to think about it. <laughs> because they're doing such a horrible job of even letting me know what their matches are that I have forgotten. That's bad. I have absolutely no idea what half of these matches are. And I don't care. And I don't care that I don't care. So there you go. All right. So uh, that led us to the final segment here, which uh, was, uh, as noted, Jared and Foley are now best friends in the world. And Jared finally agrees, all right, I'll try to get back together with Dixie. Then he goes, but what about Kurt? What about Kurt? We don't know. Foley says, we'll cross that bridge later. Said Dixie had to know there was no TNA without Jeff. And then he goes, what you need to do is go to the Impact Zone next week with your head held high, and we'll start there. And Jarrett extends his hand, and he says, let's do this. Show goes off the air. So, of course, I immediately go to see the spoilers for next week. And nowhere in the spoilers is there any mention of Jeff Jarrett. <laughs> So apparently he does not return to the Impact Zone with his head held high, for those of you that are massively intrigued by this ongoing storyline here. I could not possibly care less. So they're going to do Jarrett, Angle, and Karen in the love triangle. You know they're going to fuck it up. They fuck everything up. I cannot possibly get excited about this. I guess we'll see. We'll see. We'll give it a chance. But I, I, uh, I don't expect much. Let's just be honest. Yeah. Thumbs down for Impact this week. A bad show. A uh, show filled with shit, but uh, what can you do? Please stop watching, everyone. Yeah, not going to happen. What's your prediction for January 4th? A humbling. <laughs> <laughs> Less than a one? Maybe. Um, I, we have noted that they have the weirdly most loyal fans ever, although there was the one head-to-head time when they got crushed. Um, it is after football. They make the artificial boost from that. But I, I on the fourth? Yeah. Alright. Um I don't I don't think less than a one, but I think they may get tripled. Well. To the back. Impact. Clips from Foley storming around backstage. Borash was trying to calm him down. Foley shoved him to the floor. Nash was in the impact zone at the announcer's table for some reason. This was before the show, mind you, so why he was there, I have no idea. Going over the script, maybe. So Foley attacks him, beats him all over the place. World Elite makes a save for Kevin. Geeks broke it up. And they said that Foley was mad for what had happened in L.A. with Hogan. They did not bother to tell us what this was. No, that was a tease, you see. I hated this show for about an hour and a half. For, for, was it for that reason? Oh, I'm just getting started. I see. So, yes, they uh, they are talking about how Foley's all mad because of something, but we don't know what it is yet. It's yes. a big secret. It was a big secret. So, then we get another recap of the Foley-Jarrett meeting from last week. That is 
the second Mick Foley segment on the show. Yep, the one that consisted of six segments or so where they never explained what they were talking about. Right. But at least we got a recap. I can't complain about that. Then we had an interview with Roxy, talking about uh, some wrestling or something. She said been wrestling in Mexico to sharpen up her skills. Also, she said, I've been doing fitness competitions. Grown her hair out, bleached it blonde, facing ODB next, they said. Got real gear, too. Yeah. She vowed to give everything she had and hopefully come out with a win. That's a direct quote. So then we got a commercial for January 4th. They're actually promoting the show. That was good. Then we got an interview with Kurt Angle. The fourth straight non-wrestling segment so far. He said there was no way Wolfie McGee was beating him at the pay-per-view. So Borash asked him about Jared's return, and Angle refused to even speak of it. Just turned his back. And by the way, later in the show, Jeff Jarrett actually goes in to confront Angle, and Angle's in the same spot that he was when he did this interview. It was an hour later. Yeah, not moved. What in the hell was he doing standing in front of his locker for an entire hour? Don't know. At this point, I thought, okay, they cannot possibly have the temerity to not do a match. I was wrong. <laughs> Next, we got a video package of Tara. It seemed like we were two hours in the show already. No wrestling. So they have this video package. They actually showed a recap of when Tara was on ODB's talk show. And wept. Yeah. When she cried to build another match. They, so, in other words, they are proud of that skit. They think it was good. Yeah. They want to remind you that she wept. It was not good. They are wrong. <laughs> they are incorrect. Finally, we got a match. ODB versus Roxy, non-title. They plugged Sunday's match, which of course is ODB versus Tara for the title in a straight match with the selling point that it would be, quote, pure competition and not a drinking contest. Yes, not pure competition with Kurt Angle versus Samoa Joe or, or Chris Daniels versus Wolfie McGee. No, pure competition between ODB and Victoria. So ODB has a match with Roxy, non-title. And Roxy hits her finisher, ODB kicks out, ODB goes to get her flask, the ref stops her, and then Roxy rolls up ODB for the pin. Right. Why not? I am, every week I am caught off guard. You know what I mean? I see. I... It's like every week they catch me off guard. Like when I was watching this match... I don't know why. I know it's impact, but when I was watching this match, it never entered my brain that they could possibly have Roxy pin ODB clean. I, 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 I can't say it entered mine, but when it happened, it caught me off guard, and I thought, wow, that's a stupid thing to do. And then I just moved on. Because, you see, it's impact. Well, they do stupid things. I thought at least, at the very least, it would now be a three-way with Roxy. No. Of course not. Why would they do that? Roxy is not even on the pay-per-view. Of course not. She just pinned the women's champion in a non-title match. Right. And keep in mind, it gets better. Last fucking week, they did ODB versus Tara in a non-title match, and ODB beat her. Uh-huh. ODB beat Tara. Roxy beat ODB. <laughs> so so now Roxy is not even in the match. And she's the only one with a winning streak. I hate this show sometimes. <laughs> See, your, your standards are too high. I just expect this shit. Then, this is a perfect example of, of why I hate this show. We got another Mick Foley video. He was going four, to, I believe. He was going to Los Angeles to find Hulk Hogan. Number three. And Nash, of course, had booked his flight and all this shit. So he goes down there, and who does he run to at the gym but Lou... Ferrigno. I'm not making this up. Lou fucking Ferrigno. The bodybuilder, the former Incredible Hulk, Lou fucking Ferrigno. From when you and I were like six. So, the joke is, Mick found the wrong Hulk. It was funny that he ran into Lou Ferrigno. What is Lou Ferrigno doing on Impact? <laughs> this was funny. But then, they hammered it into the ground so badly that Mick found the wrong Hulk. I mean, maybe some people didn't get the joke early. But then they explained the joke, and then they explained it again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again. 
And by the end, I hated this segment. I never wanted to see any of these people again as long as I lived. It did go on for a long time. I did like this. They, they were in... Foley did not realize he was there to meet Lou Ferrigno, even though he was in Lou Ferrigno's house. Because there was Incredible Hulk merchandise everywhere. So, yeah, it was dumb. And, uh... I don't know. It was the third Mick Foley segment on the show. We then cut to a Kevin Nash promo where he talked about Mick Foley. He was screaming. He was angry. He said Foley had signed his death warrant. He said Foley better exercise his power while he could because come January 4th, Hogan would be there, and then Foley would be unemployed. I thought that's actually a great heel promo. He's not going to get revenge on you. He's not going to kick your ass. He's just going to talk to his buddy and make sure you get fired. So that was good. Then we had our fourth Mick Foley segment. This show was not 30 minutes old at this point. I'm just sitting here thinking of how I would have filmed the Lou Ferrigno thing. And every idea I can come up with is so much better than what they did. I'm sure. Can't you just have Foley walk into the house and there's a giant Incredible Hulk with Lou Ferrigno poster in the background and all of the Hulk, uh, the Incredible Hulk merchandise everywhere. And you have to make sure that the people see the Incredible Hulk and Lou Ferrigno's name and all this. And Foley's just sitting there going, where is Hulk? What am I doing here? Where's Hulk Hogan? And then you just have Lou Ferrigno walk in and say, hi, I'm Lou Ferrigno. And Mick Foley looks at him. And you cut away! The, That's the comedy! The only flaw is that in 2009, I think Lou Ferrigno as the Incredible Hulk is way too obscure. No, that's why I said you've got to have a giant poster of Lou Ferrigno in, in the Incredible Hulk gear with Lou Ferrigno, the Incredible Hulk, you would need on some, the fucking poster. You would need something that blatant. Go on. So, follow the segment number four. He was now back in the office of the Impact Zone. Borash was there saying, boy, Nash is mad. Foley said, well, Nash is smart, but so am I. I'm searching my wagons. I need, need all the allies I can get, and Jeff Jarrett will be my ally. And Abyss limped in. He reminded Foley and us that they were going to be a tag team match on the pay-per-view this Sunday. I had completely forgotten. And by the way, everybody, why did Abyss limp in? Well, you see, because he had been set on fire. Yeah. When? On a uh, YouTube clip. That's right. Abyss limped in. Because yeah, we haven't talked about this before. He had That's been right. burned by Stevie and Raven, but it was never on impact. No. It was a video that you had to go to YouTube to see, and it was a video that was basically a rehearsal footage, it appeared. It, it was, yes, there were. It was they TV. expected all. You know what's amazing about this? Is I can go to YouTube right now and see how many views it has. And I think it's like 65,000. How many did the Brian and Vinny battle get? Well, I don't know, but the point is. So they've got 65,000 views. So shouldn't that tell you that 1.3 million people didn't go to the fucking internet to watch your stupid fucking video? You would think. Well, it did. Well, that's the worst news. The worst news is that 60,000 people saw that clip. Yeah. They saw the clip? Well, actually, I think I may have watched it 55,000 times, <laughs> to be possible. honest with you. That is possible. But every person who saw that is a negative. Because it made this company look rinky-dink and hokey and stupid. Yes. So... The fact that they're still plugging it. Again, they think it's good. Yeah. They think the clip of the rehearsal of everyone standing around, watching a biscuit set on fire, not reacting, not caring, they think it's good for their product. I asked somebody in TNA what the hell was up with that video, and their exact words were, bro, I have no idea. That was the extent of it. No one has any idea what the hell this shit is. Yeah, so... So that was stupid, but by the end of this, Foley had somehow given Abyss a pep talk, and he had convinced him that things were going to work out, and they were still friends. So that was the end result of this shit. 35 minutes in the show, one match, by the way. So then, of course, not a match. To the back! Lauren is interviewing Suicide, the Pope, Hernandez, and Matt Morgan about their convoluted clusterfuck of a match on Sunday, where Hernandez has to be in the ring alone for five minutes, and then the other seven guys show up, and it's an elimination match. This led to a lumberjack battle. I just like that Hernandez and Morgan did all the talking, and we're about to leave, and Pope finally cut them off and said, Hey, uh, I'm the best talker here. Maybe I should say something. So he spoke for eight seconds. It was great. They all left. Hernandez and Bubba with the rest of the guys on the respective team as lumberjacks. It was your basic lumberjack match. It wasn't too bad when they had some time, and Morgan hit a choke slam. The heel lumberjacks broke it up. Brawl. Morgan went for his finish. One of the heels slid in, and... Low, low blowed him, and then uh, Bubba pinned him for the win. It was what it was. The only thing I hated here was there was a point where 
Bubba tossed Morgan outside, and the evil Lumberjacks went over, over to attack him, and the good Lumberjacks ran over, and they had a face-off. So then Bubba Ray exits the ring on the opposite side, and I don't know what he was doing, doing a little dance, setting a fire, but whatever he did, it distressed the good Lumberjacks so much, all three of them ran all the way around the ring to go get him, leaving Morgan to be attacked by the heels. Of course, just stupid. Everything else was fine. We got a video feature on Jarrett in a January 4th preview, and they kept talking about a personal issue that had put the company in jeopardy. And Again, he, no mention of what that is. Right. Then he arrived with McFoley. That is Foley's fifth segment. Yeah. And then he headed into the building, and everybody had to line up in the halls and look at him come in and act shocked. Yeah. As in, everybody, make your eyes as big as you can and open your mouth real wide and rubberneck as he just walks by. Stare. Yeah, just act Really shocked. So, of course, it looked completely fake. Lauren interviewed Beer Money, and as they're talking, up comes Joe, and they're all talking about the briefcase and title shot, and then Eric Young came up and announced that the British Invasion and Kevin Nash would be in the match as well. Yes, Kevin Nash in the briefcase match. Which, by the way, I guess prior to this interview segment, like at the beginning of the show, how many people were in Feast or Famine? Three? I believe we three we knew of. Wow. <laughs> and it's four briefcases. Three days. At the, at the beginning of the show, three days before the pay-per-view, Feast or Famine was going to have three men and a match with four cases. I just like that Eric Young walked in and he announced that basically everyone in the World Elite except the British of Asian is in this, this match. And he said their only goal was to make sure that Beer Money didn't win. Really, their goal should be to make sure that both guys in Beer Money get a briefcase and then they got a 50-50 chance of one of them being gone. You're thinking too much. I guess so. Hamada and Kong against Sarita and Taylor Wilde. Against the beautiful people. Against the beautiful people in three ways. It's not 50% if it's four cases and two guys. I believe it is. Do you want me to do math on the show? You're going to have to do some math here. Uh, okay. Robert Root is a 25% chance. Assume they both get briefcases. Well, no, because there's there's more than four men in the match. Right. There will be four briefcases total. It, that's why I said, you should make sure that beer money each gets a briefcase, because if they do, then it's 50% of one of them is fired. Hmm. Let's just move on. If each man still has a 25% chance, it's a 50% chance as a unit? Yes. Huh. There's a 50% chance that one of them will be gone and you'll be done with beer money. Hmm. I still think it's still only a 25% chance. I don't know how, but I just because do. Because you can't do math. Hamada and Kong against Sarita and Taylor Wilde against the beautiful people in a three-way. They announced no impact next Thursday. That was the best part of the show. The week after is a four-hour show with an all-female tournament and a look at the best matches of the year. Wow. Desperate for ratings. So, Madison Rain and Velvet Sky worked with Hamada. That was something else. I liked Velvet Sky whipping out the Muay Thai kicks. This went a minute, and then Hamada did a moonsault onto the tag champs. Kong sat on Madison and pinned her. And as, uh, as beautiful people are going up the ramp, they send Lauren out to interview her. And they told her to find a back seat to crawl into. And she freaked out and slapped Lacey across the face and stormed off. And the beautiful people said she would pay. Why should we care about the beautiful people and, and announce her? Well, I don't. <laughs> I don't okay, at checking. all. Uh, what I do care yeah, about, checking. the beautiful people, it's now officially their gimmick that they come out on the ramp and they tease bending over, and that is the director's cue to cut to a shot of the ramp. Jared and Foley were screaming at each other backstage. Nick Foley's sixth segment of the show. They yelled and screamed repeatedly about a mystery scenario. I have no idea why everyone always has to be yelling at each other in this show. I totally don't care. And why we, the fans, uh, I, you and I knew where they were going, but I presume most of the... If everybody were always quiet, and then all of a sudden someone started yelling, it would have impact. It's not ironic. Everybody fucking yells. Yeah, so yeah. I don't give a shit about anything that they say. So They were talking about Jarrett giving her a piece of her mind. They were talking about three little girls and Jarrett needing a job. They finally mentioned Dixie by name, and Jarrett finally relented and said he should go talk to her face-to-face. And I thought, isn't the whole point of the story, didn't it all start with Mick Foley being unable to arrange a face-to-face meeting with Dixie? Yeah. Okay, just making sure. Christy interviewed Jay Lethal because Lauren, I guess, left the entire building. And he was hyping up his invitational. Once again, Christy's selling this segment like it's all about her. Yeah. 
And again, this is why WWE hires generic geeks to do their interviews. You were so that the focus is on the star. Mm-hmm. I this is the show people think it's going to do a 1-7 <laughs> against Raw. Yes. Have you guys been watching the ratings since Hulk Hogan was announced as coming to Impact? They're going down. That's bad. It's not even like they're going up. It's not like they're gaining momentum going into January 4th. They're going down. Jay Lethal and Tatanka. Taz openly admitted that the Jay Lethal Challenge is a monthly event you know, since... Lethal lost to uh, the Anvil and was not seen for weeks. He also called Tatanka Tatanker. Yeah. Which is always good for a laugh. And speaking of good for a laugh, Tatanka comes out. He has his Indian music. He has his feathered headdress, his face paint, his turquoise, his tomahawk. And they called him a Native American star. Mm-hmm. In case we were not clear <laughs> what all this dress made. Was well, for. some people may be confused and thought he was a cowboy. <laughs> or a samurai. Lethal cut him off. Went for the flying elbow. Tatanka hit him in the gut and hit the Indian death drop, the tomahawk drop, or whatever they call so it. Let's call the it Samoan drop. Samoan Even drop. Like it's a Samoan drop. So, yes, for those of you keeping track, the old <laughs> WWF wrestlers are better than the new TNA guys. By leaps and bounds. Yeah. You know, there was, there was one point here where... He may have been the most over guy in the show, Tatanka. Probably. But there was a point here where Tatanka took... I keep stuttering on his name. Tatanka took a turnbuckle shot and then sort of stumbled backwards and took this just... Horrible back bump where he basically sat down to his ass and rolled back. If you take that moment out, this is pretty fun. I was fine with this match. And they can bring Tatanka back. I'm fine. Machine Guns did a promo about how nobody cared they about plugged, him. He plugged a title match I was not aware was happening. Yeah, I wasn't either. They said nobody cared about him and they didn't give a fuck and they were going to beat British Invasion on Sunday. Yeah, that's the gist of it, yes. More with Foley and Jeff. Number seven. Foley said he could handle the talking when they went in to talk to Dixie, and Jeff said, no, I'll, I'll do it my way, me and Dixie one-on-one. We had the ran down the pay-per-view card. Mike Tanae said this about Final Resolution. It's so final. <laughs> yeah. Jared met with Dixie in her office, and they proceeded to act. He said he wanted to come back to impact the company he founded. And she said before they talked about the future, they needed to be crystal clear about the past. She said he put the company in a terrible position, and he lied to her. He said when they got on that plane years ago to make a bunch of promises to Kurt Angle, Jeff ending up with his wife was not one of them. And she said she gave him what she wanted or what she thought were his best options, and that was sit on the sidelines and hope time healed these wounds. He said he was sorry if he disrespected her, was sorry for everything. She said at this point it was not about her. He had to go face Kurt and take responsibility for his actions. And he said, okay, thanks. So that was the big reveal of what they've been teasing now for literally a show and a half. And by the way, more. he made the reveal he, he in one line. It was one line. It was her. It was her. She said, yeah. when we got on that plane it years was... ago to make a bunch of promises to Kurt, you ending up with his wife was not one of them. Yes. Now, And then she moved on. Now, also, am I wrong, or did the announcers not make a single mention of this the rest of the show? Well... <laughs> <laughs> Not directly, although in the next match, uh, somewhere on here, Taz, that was the, it was the main event, Taz did mention, in, in reference to Steiner and Lashley, you do not mess around with another man's wife. <laughs> but I don't know if he was talking about this or not. But anyway, yes, no follow-up. No, none. They didn't hammer this home. If you were up eating a sandwich, if you were checking the board, if you were uh, up doing something or you, you turned away for a moment... You still have no, absolutely no idea what's going on. No. No recap later. And, and it, even if you were in the room but not paying attention, maybe you were on the phone while Impact was on or, or whatever. Checking a text message. There was no indication that anything important had happened. It it, was, it's not like... If you miss this one second of the show, one second mm-hmm. of a two-hour show, yes. you still have absolutely no idea what's going on. Yeah. It was not Kurt grabbing a microphone and shouting, You stole my wife! Or Jarrett... Going to the ring and saying, your wife's with me now. You left her or whatever. No. It was one second, and then they moved on, and that was that. And then Dixie said, you need to go talk to Kurt. And I just thought, I would just get back on a plane and head right back to Nashville immediately. Daniels and Desmond Wolf, after all of the bullshit on the show, they give us this match. This was awesome. Oh, yeah. Ten-minute time limit. They worked the cravat early. Awesome. They worked the cravat so early. 
and so long and so well that Taz and Mike Tanay were forced to discuss it and then debate whether or not it was more effective than a standard side headlock. Yes. This m- melted my heart. I just fell in love with this show at this point, really. The crowd, I mean, say what you will, it just amazes me that they think that what these Impact fans want to see is goofy acting and stupid skits and wacky comedy. And meanwhile, there's a match here built around a cravat. Uh-huh. And the fans are going ape shit and chanting, this is awesome. Yeah. They did cravat spots for like five minutes. Then they have a get stare down and they slap each other and they traded elbows and they started doing stuff. Nigel applied was basically a hammerlock crossface. The crowd went ape shit. Daniel's got the Koji clutch. They went ape shit again. And then this was the finish. They were trading small packages. Small packages, mind you. Yeah. The crowd was chanting, this is awesome, to small packages. And then the time them expired, everyone booed, and then Shannon let them fight. And then it ended. And I wanted to see them fight. I don't want to see them fight. I endorse these two men being wrestling each other on impact. I was going to say until the end of the year, but until the end of next year. I want to see this more than I want to see the matches they're going to be having on Sunday. Of course. Shocking. So, this, I don't know, I, because I have lower standards for the standards for the show, I do not hate it as much as you going into this segment, but this segment definitely saved the entire show. We had the meeting with Jared and Kurt. Foley was back, so this was number seven? Eight? Eight. I wasn't actually sure if this was Impact or if it was, uh, what's that movie he just did? Endgame? I forget. Kurt Scott is back to Jared, and Jared says, Kurt, I'm here. And Kurt says, I heard you were coming. <laughs> I expected him to pull out a pistol and then have a duel. So Jared said, listen, man to man, if I disrespected you or offended you in any way, shape, or form, yeah, if I offended you by fucking your wife... I'm raising your daughter. I'm really sorry about that, Kurt. Do you hear me? I'm sorry, he says. And so Kurt just says, I've got a match, and he walks out. But he didn't mention any of that, by the way. He just said, if I've offended you, I'm sorry. And Kurt said he had a match. So again, again, if you you turned away for three seconds on the Dixie promo, you were clueless. And by the way, if anybody has been uh, keeping track, the Dixie Carter segments on the show... I believe have consistently been the lowest rated segment on every show in the last three or four weeks. So, in other words, a lot of people didn't see what happened. Signer Raven, Steve, Brutus Magnus, Doug Williams against AJ Styles, Kurt Lashley, Abyss, and Tomko. By the way, this was Tomko's official return to the ring. They did not bill it. Nope. They did not bill it in advance in any way. He just all of a sudden walked out on the ramp with the rest of his team. Yes. So... Taz kept talking about the fire footage. Yes. He said, and I quote, It is very graphic and horrifying, I can tell you. (laughs) I'll say. So, long story short, five of these men disappeared immediately. Yeah. Abyss, Raven, and Steve, he brawled to the back, and then Steiner and Lashley brawled to the back. If you're not paying attention, that means we were left with Kurt, AJ, and Lashley. Tomko. Tomko, what the hell? Angle, AJ, and Tomko is Brutus and and, uh, and Doug Williams. The point being, see, see, you're not confused. The point being, it was three on two baby phases. Yeah. And they just did the match. Yeah. So they wrestled for a while. They cut backstage where the five men were brawling throughout, you know, the outside. The highlight of which was that Steiner and uh, Lashley were whipping each other in their guardrails and whatnot. In the background, people are just walking around. They don't care about these two giant men fighting. So then Rob Terry snuck up on Tomko and pulled him off the apron. Uh, it broke down. The guys were flying all over everywhere. Finally, AJ pinned somebody with a small package. Yeah. And uh, and then we had Angle and AJ having a stare down. And Angle, by the way, has a bad back. He didn't even work the first night of the taping as he worked this show. And I don't know, but he had the stare down with AJ, and he looked gizmoed out of his mind. So hopefully he's all right. But uh, Desmond and Daniels, who just wrestled each other, ran down and teamed up to beat them both up. And that was the end of that. So not a terrible show, but... This was far and away the best show we have watched this week. I can't imagine anybody wanting to buy the pay-per-view still. I mean, all the oh, matches... Oh, hell no. Hell no. I don't know. Unless you just love Daniels and AJ. Yeah, that match will be good. 
Yeah, unless they overbook it. But I'd rather see Daniels and Nigel. Yes. I just saw them go to a five-minute draw, and I want oh. to see a resolution. A ten-minute draw, but you know you want it a 20 minutes. It is final resolution. Can I get a final resolution for the Desmond versus Chris Daniels match, please? I guess not. To the back. TNA final resolution was tonight. Good news is great main event. There's a good semi-main event. There's a good opener. Yeah, I was going to say. It's about where the good news ends. Unfortunately, it was also a middle section of the show. Actually, if you only watch the opener, the semi-main, and the main event, you'd probably think this was one of the better pay-per-views of the year. Fortunately, most everybody watched the rest of it. And if you only watch the middle, boy, are you angry right now. I know I was, until the main event came along. This show, the story of this show to me is, these are the people that are going to supposedly be challenging WWE. Good luck! We had, what a shit show this pay-per-view was. We had the announcers not having any idea what was going on. Mm -hmm. We had video packages airing for matches that weren't airing next, and they even admitted that. Oh, we screwed up. Yeah. Usual camera problems, that sort of thing. The the usual, yeah, missing action. And then one point during a match where they just cut to a man. Yeah, they just cut to a man in the middle of the angle Nigel McGuinness match. They cut to him. It It was eventually explained who this man was, but I mean like 20 minutes later. Yeah. Is in the middle of the match, they cut to this man, he looked at the camera, he smiled, he pointed to his kid and then pointed to the camera, his kid looked at the camera, then they went back to the match, mm-hmm. and nobody bothered to make any mention of who this man was. There was an awkward pause there, indicating to me that Taz and Tanae had no idea who he was. Yeah. There were a lot of problems on this show. This was a pretty damn rinky-dink show. Not the least of which, the, the thing, more than anything else that stood out on this show, was, it is December of 2009... And we saw Hernandez give Jesse Neal the hardest fucking chair shot you've ever seen. Yeah. This was when I decided, I really hope that on January 4th, TNA does like a .1 rating, and Dixie Carter just pulls the plug. Because that was a moment where I thought, you know, the wrestling business is really better off without TNA. Because looking aside, and God bless all the wrestlers and that sort of thing, but Feast or Fired, for example... I mean, there was so much, there were so many chemicals in that ring, in that match alone, <laughs> not to mention the rest of the show. You know, at least WWE tries to have a semblance of a wellness policy, nothing even remotely resembling a wellness policy in WWE. Test dead uh, two weeks ago now, and absolutely no secret that he had uh, severe brain injuries, so here we are on TNA, and it's like they live in another world. Yes. It's like they live in, an, in a parallel dimension where nobody's ever heard of Chris Benoit. Nobody's ever heard of Test. It's like, I would prefer to believe that they lived in a parallel dimension. I mean, people can make all the fun they want of, of Dave and I living in a bubble and not knowing about what's going on in popular culture. Like, that has anything to do with anything. But Jesus Christ, when you live in a bubble about your own industry... Just get out. Just get out. I was so angry when I saw that chair shot. I almost just turned the thing off and said, Vince, just go home. I'm done with TNA. But I paid fucking, how much was it? $44, $34 for the show. I figured I should at least watch it. And by the end of the show with the main event, I I was at least, I will not say I'd forgiven them because I did not. But at least with the main event, there was something. There were two people to be happy for in this company. AJ Styles and Chris Daniels actually had a great match. But, man, just all through the evening, one thing after another, what a rinky-dink, low-rent promotion this is. You know what I mean? Absolutely. The best parts of this show were, like, Mick Foley cutting a promo about how he wanted to see Hulk Hogan on January 4th. Just an old-school wrestling promo. We had great pro wrestling in the opener in the main event. And I wasn't even really... I mean, I gave the the Nigel Angle match three and a quarter stars, but it should have been a hell of a lot more than that. And what really took it down to me was the announcers. The announcers in that match were horrible, okay? Now, granted, I'm sure that most people probably don't follow... Actually, you know what? Nowadays, a lot of people do follow MMA. When these guys were doing these holds and the announcers were trying to say it was an Uma Plata, but it wasn't. It was not anything like an Uma Plata. And then like five minutes later, it was actually an Uma Plata, and then they called it something completely different. These announcers were completely out to lunch in this match. And uh, angles hurt. It was rather slow-paced. It was a fucking... It was a match where they said the first fall can only be won via pinfall. Right. The second match can only be won via submission. 
but it was in a cage for all three matches. Mm -hmm. And if you used a cage in the first or second match, you would be disqualified. What? Yeah. Everything on the show, as always, is more complicated than it needed to be. There was one match where it was one person, one man versus one man. Uh, That was only in the main event. And it was the best match on the show. It was the best match on the show. There was also one women's match and one normal tag match. Then we had Feast or Fired. We had the Survivor Series match with the head start. We had Last Man Standing. And then we had the wacky triple fall thing, which would have been so much better if they just lost the cage and did one fall and just did the middle fall of this match and they were just exchanging submission after submission. The only, that would have been much better. The only match where something stupid didn't happen was the main event. That literally was the only match where something stupid yeah. didn't happen. AJ did take a really stupid fall on his head. Well, that happens right there. You can't stop him, I guess. Let's talk about this pay-per-view. The opener was a British Invasion and the Motor City Machine Guns, TNA Tag Titles. This was a three-and-a-half-star match. Probably should have been more, but it was one of those matches where they hit a peak and then they kept going. Mm -hmm. And the bigger issue was that what happened was they do this match. It's really, really good. The crowd is going absolutely nuts for it. And finally, it breaks down into a four-way and uh, Shelly hits the sliced bread on Magnus, his finisher. Magnus kicks out. Immediately, the crowd starts to die. And I think that they knew that as soon as Brutus Magnus kicked out of the sliced bread, mm-hmm. that meant the guns were not winning. Yeah. And these people really wanted the guns to win. So, to cut to the chase, the guns hit every finisher that they have. They hit the sliced bread. They hit the double super kick. They hit... A big splash neckbreaker combo, and the heels kicked out of everything. Mm-hmm. And for half of these, it wasn't even like the other heel broke it up. No, they it just was kicked like out. They hit a finisher, and the guy just kicked out. One guy kicked out of a double team finisher repeatedly. So the heels kick out of everything. They kick out of one big move after another. They kick out, they kick out, they kick out, they kick out. And finally, there's a thumb to the eye, a double team power bomb on Saban. One, two, three. Now, Often you will see, like, a really good match where the guys that lose get over just as big as the winners, sometimes even more. This has happened a million times in wrestling history. Steve Austin and Bret Hart, for example, at WrestleMania. Happens all the time. This is not one of them. No. This was, I, I, I can't really quite call it a burial, but it was pretty damn close. You, when the heels kick out of every move that you hit them with, and then they hit you with one move and pin you, yeah. you are way down on the ladder compared to these guys. So, three and a half stars... But um, this was the day the Machine Guns really should have taken the titles. I see no good reason why they didn't put them on them. And uh, took the crowd down quite a bit. It was funny because they it opened with the Machine Guns running wild and everything was great and I was happy. And then the uh, British Invasion got the heat for maybe two minutes. And then they went right to, the hot, right to the hot tag. And I thought, wow, that's disappointing. I wish this match had more time. And then they started doing every move on Earth, and I thought, wow, that's disappointing. I wish this match match had not gone so long. So basically, we needed more heat and less of these stupid near falls in the end. And then by the end, as you noted, the machine guns had done every single thing they could possibly do, and it was not close to enough. No. And, 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 uh, there was nothing. There was, like, no finisher left that they had. Right. They used every finisher they could come up with on these guys, and they just kept kicking out. And then British Invasion, when they were tired of toying with them, hit a move and pinned them. Yeah. So, yes, as, as noted, this... This really made the machine guns look like geeks. Yeah. But maybe that was the goal. ODB and Tara for the women's title in a straight professional wrestling match. Here is, again, the stupidity of TNA. The feud starts. The very first match they have together is a hardcore street fight that involves drinking first. That was a supposed stipulation. For free on impact. Which, by the way, the champion won. And the storyline was that in a hardcore match, ODB has the advantage, but in a straight professional wrestling battle, Tara has the advantage. Now, that is all fine and good to tell that story if the two guys in question are, say, Chris Daniels and AJ Styles, where they can have an awesome straight professional wrestling match, as we saw in the main event. That's not what we had here. With ODB and Tara, they're... Hardcore match was much better than this straight wrestling match. No one could argue this. Because they're not really very good wrestlers. And in fact, I don't know how it is possible, but every time I see Tara wrestle, wrestle, she looks greener than she was the time before. You know what I mean? No, I, I've... She looks like she's she's going back to wrestling school. I wonder if... She was really good in WWE. I, I, I feel an urge to go back and watch those matches and see what... It, Maybe she had weaknesses then and just did a better job of hiding them. Maybe she had that, better she's, opponents. She's Maybe better they opponents. laid the matches out better. Maybe, Maybe they had a, flaws. I don't know, but no. They did have fit 
Finley is a fucking agent in sure WWE. That, not hurt. And they have Terry Taylor here. Big mm-hmm. difference. Yeah. So regardless, they have this match. Tara looks lost half the time. She's in slow motion. The whole thing is clunky. ODB didn't save it either. And uh, they did a slow motion comeback. And Tara finally got a pin with a cradle. I gave it star and a quarter. It wasn't like a complete disaster, but it really was not good at all. No. The other thing is the before all their title matches in TNA, they always put up a wacky screen like tag lines or X factors for the X division title. This is the first time I've noticed this. Maybe they won't, they've always done it, but the little screen for the women's title match reads "Tail of the Tape," and "Tail" is spelled T-A-I-L. <laughs> that is lovely. We had Tara doing a promo, thanking all the fans, saying she couldn't have done this without them. She said she thought the peak of her career was beating Kong in a cage, but this was what she came to TNA for, the title. I could have sworn she won the title in the match with Kong, but apparently she forgot as well. I guess she only had it for like eight days. So anyway, she started crying. As, as usual, yes. This is a bewildering promo. She's got the Tommy Dreamer gimmick, of all things. Yeah. There's a gimmick that we don't need more of, okay, everyone? Pinning ODB with a virtually a fluke roll-up is better than beating Awesome Kong in a cage match. Strange. Feast, feast are fired. Taz, before this was on, outright said, flat, he would not want to be in the match. Yeah. Always good. Feast are fired, which had Cody Diener, Beer Money, Eric Young, The Sheik, Kiyoshi, Homicide, Big Rob, Kevin Nash, and Samoa Joe. It is a pole match. There were briefcases on all the poles. One had a world title shot, one had a tag title shot, the third had an X title shot, and the last had a pink slip. And uh, as, of course, why would anyone do this match? I mean, is is a shot at the X title really more important than your actual entire career? It's been, they've done this now three times. And every year, speech every time. Every year it's pointed out how stupid people are for being involved. Yes. So they have this match. And Nash came out. I mean, this is just just classic TNA. Months ago, they were doing this storyline where Nash was looking for a new valet. He had wine. He reminded us to be wet. Then, like, two months ago, the, the vignettes just stop. Haven't seen a single vignette on TV for, like, two straight months. So Nash comes out for this match, and who is on his arm? A woman. A girl. They said, Nash is out with the winner of the Kevin Nash World Diva Tour contest, or whatever it's called. And she came out. She disappeared. She was never seen again. Awesome. So they have this match. It is your usual completely shitty battle royal. And they have a spot where Cody Diener's going to get the briefcase, but Bashir tries to stop him. They both get it. They fight for it. Bashir wins a tug of war. So right then you knew he's getting fired. So then we had, uh, then we had, who was second to get it? I think Big Rob got one. Big Rob was second. And, and as soon as Big Rob gets the case, Eric Young starts yelling at him. Why? Well, today and Taz explained that Eric Young had called a meeting. And keep in mind, we did not see this. Eric Young had called a meeting and told his guys not to get a case. Fine. They at least told the story. However, they don't explain why Eric Young yelled at Big Rob, but he did not yell at the Sheik, who had got the case first. Okay, fine. So then the next guy to get a case is Nash who is also on Eric's team. Now, if you think Nash got yelled at by Eric, well, obviously he did not, because these people have no idea what they're doing. So then, Tanae's like, maybe he didn't have that speech after all. Maybe he maybe he changed his mind about the guys getting the case. Well, no, because he yelled at someone for getting a case. He There was a point here, after Big Rob got his case, where Eric Young called a halt to the match. And Eric yelled at Rob, and Kevin Nash was in the ring, and someone else from World Elite, and the action, in total nonstop action, stopped. Just a complete stop. We watched four men have a debate in the middle of this pole match battle royal. So this was the first, I think this was the first time during the evening, where the announcers had absolutely no idea what was going on. It would get worse. So then we have the uh, last guy to get a case, which is Samoa Joe. And star and a half, again, probably being generous, a complete clusterfuck, filled with a bunch of idiot wrestlers, apparently. So, unlike in the past, they opened up all of the cases on this show. And prior to this, by the way, they had an interview with AJ and Kurt about the main events, and uh, they both ran down their opponents. Not much to it. They vowed to win and then take care of unfinished business with each other. So, unlike in the past, as noted, they opened the cases, and so Cal Val's boobs were out there to to, uh, co-host with Borash, and they had all the guys in a line looking so stupid. (laughs) I mean... The, the highlight of Nothing this first. looks dumber than four guys out there with briefcases just standing still like 
Complete idiots. Trying to recatch their breath. Yeah. Just puffing and puffing. Nash looked like such a dork out there with these guys. The, I, I was hoping he would actually get fired in his first appearance with his new girl. That would be awesome. But he, uh, they opened his case first, and they put it up on a podium, and Borash is giving this big dramatic speech about how there could be a world title shot in here. There could be a tag team title shot in here. Or you could be watching January 4th from your home in Daytona Beach or whatever. And as he said this, Nash kind of raised his eyebrows like, I would be fine with that. <laughs> He did not seem to care. No. So they opened his case. He got a tag team title match. So I guess Scott Hall is coming back in 2009. What more could you ask for in TNA? Number two was Joe. And he opened his, and it was a world title shot. So, just to keep track, everybody, the current number one contenders as of this moment were Chris Daniels, who was getting a shot in the main event, Kurt Angle, who'd agreed to a match with AJ Styles. Bobby Lashley, who won the Thanksgiving Feast or Fire or whatever that stupid thing was at tournament. And now Samoa Joe. We have four number one contenders in TNA. Well, theoretically, by the end of the show, it's down to three, but yes. wonder why nobody gets over, ever, in this company. Yeah. So the next person open was uh, Rob, Terry, and the Sheik, since they both had a case and they wanted to build up some drama. And they showed a close-up, and Sheik was happy and smiling, and Rob was sad and... Forlorn, and if so, of course, Sheik was fired. Yeah, swerve. And the real news out of this, Rob Terry got an X Division title shot. Yeah. We are going to get to see Rob Terry wrestle Amazing Red. Yes. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> I, I will Possibly be full horrible. of awe. And then Borash literally future endeavored the Sheik. He, like, threw his briefcase aside and then stormed out, and that was it. And Sheik is leaving, by the way, so he's well, actually go. gone. That's good. We had Rhino... And Jesse Neal and Team 3D against Hernandez and Pope and Suicide and Matt Morgan. This was the match that I hated with such a fucking passion because I'll well, just go over the whole thing. First off, due to a wacky stip on impact, Hernandez has to face all four guys for five minutes before it becomes an eight-man Survivor Series elimination match. Got all that? So he's doing a match, and within or first they go, check out the countdown clock. Meanwhile, there's no countdown clock. It, like, at random moments, appeared for, like, two seconds and disappeared again. Apparently, they're charged by the second to have a graphic on the screen. So, he's doing this match, and they announce that there's a minute left. And then he pins, he pins Devon. So, what a fucking geek he turned out to be. Four on one, and Devon gets pinned. It was Rhino. Rhino, I'm sorry. Rhino's the geek. So, so uh, Rhino gets pinned. And uh, so then, of course, the five-minute time limit expires. Actually, no, it gets it better. Gets, there's more stupidity. Yeah, let me let me get to uh, what actually happened. So there are, there's about a minute left, and Rhino gets pinned. And all of a sudden, Jesse Neal goes outside, and he gets a chair. And the announcers are like, why would you get a chair? If you use that chair, it's a disqualification. So he gets in the ring. The ref is looking right at him. He's teasing using this chair. He's about to hit... He's about to hit Hernandez when suddenly the, the time limit expires and all of the rest of the baby faces run down. This causes Jesse Neal to not hit him. Why? I don't know. So, now, technically at this point, because Rhino got pinned, it was four on three. Yes. My thinking is, well, they will say that Hernandez is worn out from his five minutes, and so realistically it will be three on three. Next thing they do is have Hernandez hit his giant dive. Yeah. He's fine. It is four on three advantage baby faces. So they're they're doing this match here, and uh, Suicide tries a leg drop on a Neil, sits right on his face, off the top rope, mind you. So, God, does it suck to be Neil. And the match wasn't even over yet. So he hits his thing. He almost kills him. Hernandez then gets a... Uh, well, I, I'm first, sorry, Neil. Neil got a chair. Neil gets a chair. It gets complicated, everyone. Please bear with us. Neil gets the chair that he'd already been warned if he uses his disqualification. He gets it right in front of the referee. He swings the chair... And he hits Suicide. And by the way, this is a nice, light yep. chair yep. shot. We, we, I'm fine with no this. No problem with Jesse Neal here. He hits a nice, light chair shot on Suicide right in front of the ref. And the ref does nothing. <laughs> There's no bell. No. Nope. There's no signal. The ref stares at Jesse Neal for, Neal for a while. And the announcers pause. They wait for a signal. None is coming. They then say the referee is giving Jesse Neal a warning. They start to hem and haw. Why is this not a disqualification, they ask? I guess he's just getting a warning. So the match continues, and then Hernandez gets the chair, and he fucking hits the hardest goddamn chair shot you've ever seen. He wraps this fucking chair around Jesse Neal's head. Jesse Neal crumbles, does not look good, and uh, they end up 
carting him out. And as he's being carted away, they disqualified Hernandez. And then about a minute later, the announcers are like, well, we've now been informed that Jesse Neal has also been disqualified. Thanks for the update here. So anyway, fuck these guys for their chair shot. I've already given my rant. I don't even know what else to add to this. So uh, the rest of the match was just complete bullshit. It was 3D pinning suicide, and then we had 3D pinning the Pope. So it was 3D versus Morgan. Devon fingers him right in the eyes, right in front of the ref. That's not a DQ. That's okay. And finally, Morgan boots Devon. The ref starts to count, but holds up his count. Everybody's confused again. Then the bell rings, and he's eliminated. And finally, he kicks a chair into Diva, or so Bubba's head for the pin. And just a fucking embarrassment of a match, an embarrassment to the company in every conceivable way. Miss spots, a clusterfuck, announcers have no idea what's going on. Minus two stars, and that's being generous. The only good part of this entire match If was... I could just piss on this company right now. Mm-hmm. Like, if I if the impact zone were right next door and I could just walk over there and piss on the side of the fucking impact zone, I would do it right now. That was one of my goals when I went to Universal I Orlando. Was but it was so filled with rage watching this. Not able to, uh, they had that section of the lot closed off the day I was there. But, yeah, the, the only good part of this was when it came down to two-on-two, Pope made a great one-on-two comeback against 3D. Pope is awesome. And the point of this great one-on-two comeback was to set up his own pin. So he lost that way anyway. So, yes. This sucked violently, literally, and uh, it, I don't know, I, I think right, this went from being a bad show to being a, a horrific show where I did not want to watch it anymore, and uh, it took me a long time. In fact, I really never really recovered from this match. Abyss and Foley, Raven and Stevie video package, they show the entire thing, including that YouTube video. The, the, the one where Abyss is set on fire as everyone stands around watching. Yeah. They tried to cover by... There was one shot where you can clearly see people standing around in his TV, like in his shorts. They cut to another shot where at least it's close up on Abyss rolling around on fire, and they piped in screams. So I guess they sort of realized how bad it was and tried to make it better two weeks late. Yeah. So they do this entire package. They cut back to Tanae, who basically says, that's the wrong I've package. Got, I've got the exact quote. Go for it. Got a little bit ahead of ourselves here. He giggles. Then he says, now let's preview the next match at Final Resolution. Last man standing rules. They immediately go to another uh, video package. It's Lashley and Steiner. Amazing. Amazing death of TNA moment. So then we have the last man standing match. And, uh, again, the obvious question. They send Crystal to the back. Steiner tries to abduct her, which begs the question, why is Dixie so upset that Jeff Jarrett fucked Karen when Steiner is stalking Bobby Lashley's wife on every single show? At least Jeff and Karen were consensual in their sexual intercourse. Indeed. Steiner's trying to rape her, but this is not a big deal. So Lashley gave him a T-bone. Steiner immediately grabbed his quad. He either injured his knee or his leg or something. He limped the entire rest of the match, gutted his way through it. Steiner, of course, the heel, but he's doing every babyface spot in the book. The top rope, Frankensteiner. Yes. Everybody's cheering and cheering and chanting. That was awesome at him. And finally, a classic TNA finish with nobody knowing what they're doing. Crystal runs down. She throws a pipe to Bobby Lashley. Lashley grabs the pipe. He then proceeds to put the pipe down. He spears Steiner. He goes back and he picks the pipe back up, and then he hits Steiner with the pipe, and then he gets the pin. Because you see they had to get all their shit in, or something. I don't know. I don't know. Star and three-quarter. This is one where you say Steiner gutted out this injury, and that's not good. Because what happened was, he realized he was hurt. He retreated to the corner. Uh, Lashley... Hit him once really good and then realized he was fucked up and hit some uh, safer punches. Then he put on his Dragon Sleeper submission and put Scott to sleep. And I thought, okay, last man standing. He is done. And then Scott just woke up and he kept wrestling. So what we had here was Steiner was hindering himself by working on a hurt leg. He was hurting Lashley by making it look like he could not beat a one-legged man. And in fact, was getting dominated by a one-legged man. And he hurt us by having to watch it. It would have been much better if he had just got put to sleep and just stayed there, like what would really happen if you were actually choked out. I liked how they, they kept doing these last man standing rules, and somebody would be down in the rough and be like, One! Two! And then, of course, after the pipe shot, the ref goes, One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten! Ring the bell! Why don't you just tell us it's fake? Raven and Stevie against Foley and Abyss... In a hardcore match. 
I gave it two and three quarter stars. It was exactly what you expect. They did a bunch of dumb stuff with stuff. Foley did a dive off of a, a stage and landed right on his hip on the cement at uh, 44, whatever he is right now. And uh, at one point, Abyss and uh, I guess Foley and Raven brawled backstage, and they just disappeared for a while. And then Raven comes out, and Foley's not there. And we'd never seen what happened backstage. The announcers are like, where's Foley? I'm sitting here thinking, where's Foley? I assumed that Raven had lured him into catering and he got distracted. I thought that maybe they had taped something and forgot to play it. So he disappears for a long time. Raven comes back out. And then eventually Foley just comes out with a shopping cart full of gizmos. So where he was, why Raven stopped attacking him or vice versa, why they just split up, why Foley was back there while his friend was getting attacked two-on-one just so he could fill up a shopping cart with bullshit, I have no idea. So they did a bunch of stuff, and uh, like I said, uh, oh, the best part was Foley wraps Stevie in barbed wire. He puts him on a table on the cement. He does a running flying dive off the ramp through the air, through Stevie and the barbed wire and the table to the cement. And then in the ring, Abyss hits one black hole slam for the pin. Not on thumbtacks. No. Well, in fact, he gave a black hole slam onto powder. Yes, Raven threw powder at Foley's eyes at one point. Or I should say, he threw powder towards Foley. It didn't make it all the way. He was too far away. And at this point, Taz asks, is that powder? It could have been Coke. It could have been a solid object, I suppose. Sure. It could have so, been something that disintegrated in midair. There was all kinds of wackiness. A meteorite. The, <laughs> there was all kinds of wackiness. Uh... Raven, or Raven Foley and Abyss used a double socko claw where they each pulled out a sock and put it on and put a claw on. Uh, the best part to me was the barbed wire, just because, you know, Halloween was two months ago, and I, I think on November 1st, Mick Foley or someone went to their local Halloween supply store and bought some fake barbed wire at a really cheap rate because they took this, it was a wheel of barbed wire, not a roll or a strand, it was a wheel, and they put it around Stevie. It did not bend at all. Stevie stood there, screaming like he could not move his arms, and he was put on the table, and, and then Foley hit the elbow. It was very, very phony, is my point. Yeah. Hey, better than that than a real barbed wire, for I, Christ's sake. Or a real chair, yes. Then Joe did a promo, and as much as people talk about what a great promo writer Russo is, Joe actually said that he now possessed the most dangerous thing in the world. An atomic bomb? Anthrax? Ebola? Perhaps in a vial? No, the most dangerous thing in the world is a title shot. Then we had Tanae and Taz trying to make sense of the whole Angle-Nigel deal with the illegal submission last month, which was a triangle, which is a legal submission. Anyway, three matches, the rules, that sort of thing, and they looked like they had absolutely no idea what they were talking about. And I can't blame them! <laughs> it all makes no sense. It all makes no sense. So we talked about Angle versus Desmond, three stages of pain. The cage was surrounding the ring for all three matches. The first match, you could only win via pin, but if you used the cage, it was a DQ. Don't even ask me. So the first fall saw Desmond pin Angle with, like, the fourth Tower of London that he tried. Then the second was all submission wrestling on the mat, which was pretty good, but I was not blown away by it. And like I said, the announcers just killed this. And finally, he uh, scissored the ankle, and Nigel tapped out. So, uh, good pop for that also, but not a lot of heat for the rest of the match. And then finally, the third match was uh, just a straight cage match. Both guys bladed. Taz actually said he's gaffed open, <laughs> which is an old-school term for, for blading. So, I don't know why he didn't just say, He cut himself with a blade, everybody! And uh, TNA, by the way, is just like one giant inside joke. Where the only people laughing are TNA, and they're actually the last people that should be laughing. So, finally, they uh, they did some stuff. Desmond passed out from the pain due to an ankle lock, and he began convulsing. He was unconscious and convulsing. So this was He tried to go out the door, but Angle pulled him back in and put him in the hold. So, the door's wide open. Nigel is unconscious and convulsing. So, Kurt Angle decides, I'm going to go over the cage. <laughs> Not through the door, over the cage. So he starts to climb, and he gets to the top, and Nigel sees him at the top, and suddenly springs to life. No more convulsing, no more unconsciousness, no more pain. He just starts sliding towards the door. Angle drops to the floor and beats him, and uh, three and a quarter stars. Last month was a hell of a lot better. Too many gimmicks in this match. Yeah, there's just too much stuff going on. And 
these matches like this are so stupid where each fall is a different step because, I mean, everyone knows if you do two out of three falls in the two major companies, it's going to go three falls anyway. But when you make it like the third fall has the biggest stipulation of all, everyone knows that it's going to go three falls. So there was not much drama in the first fall because it didn't matter who won. And there was not much drama in the second fall because they knew who was going to win. And then the third fall, they got into a little bit. But what can you do? If they, like I said before, if they had just done this as a straight one-on-one match and it had mostly resembled the second fall of this where they were exchanging 400 submissions in a row, it would have been so much better. And there was a point as they were doing all this sweet chain wrestling where the fans were chanting, this is wrestling. Yeah. And to their credit, they were chanting this, but they were not chanting it passionately. They were... <laughs> I, I don't know how to explain this. It's like they knew it was wrestling. They wanted it known that it was, it was wrestling, but they have seen better wrestling. It was a, a lukewarm chant. Then we saw better wrestling, which was the main event. It was Daniels versus AJ for the TNA title. AJ's always great, but Daniels in this match was a hero. He was so fucking awesome yeah. in this match. Uh-huh. I don't know what to say. They they had a fantastic professional wrestling world title match main event. It was like, again, it is amazing that this was the main event on this show. It just did not belong, to be honest with you. And uh, it was great. They They used every spot. Every spot built to a bigger spot. It was not like one of those matches where they just did move after move after move and nothing made any sense at all. Everything they did, there was a point to it. Uh, Daniels working over AJ's back. They saved all their uh, their familiar moves for the end and, and turned them into a... a uh, they worked everything in the match perfectly. And uh, they did one uh, Siles clash where Daniels kicked out. And then uh, at the end of the match, he went for a Frankensteiner off the top, which earlier he'd hit... But this time when he went for it, AJ knew it was coming. He grabbed him in mid-move. He did a Styles Clash off the middle rope. He got the pin. Three and a quarter stars, maybe three and a half. It was just it's very, really great professional wrestling. It was very hard to tell after the show. I suspect if I went back and watched this again, I'd probably like it a lot more. It'd probably be well in the four-star range. But, yeah, it was just impossible to get into after this show. The, before the angle match, I asked you, how long is the show? And then I remember the angle match was three falls. So I was very tired by the end of this. Um, I suspect we're, uh, uh, well, especially I'm underwriting the match, but the, the one stupid thing I, I noted earlier was AJ took something and ended up on the apron. Like, he took a he took a move in the ring and kicked out and rolled to the apron. And then he rolled to the floor in such a manner as that the only way he could land was on top of his head and neck. Dumb! He's a main event on a pay-per-view. It was a main event. Well, that's, well that, there's still, that's still stupid. Like, uh, when Daniels... You know why it is stupid? Let me just say this. Mm-hmm. Because it's the TNA Final Resolution pay-per-view. It's it's going to do 20,000 buys. Yes. Okay? An average impact will do at least, you know, 1.4 million viewers or 1.3 million viewers. No one's going to see the stupid thing. At least land on your head before 1.3 million viewers if you have to do it. I mean, it's not like WWE where people collect WrestleMania DVDs. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, how many people are really purchasing TNA pay-per-views on DVD to save for their collection? Uh, Roughly the same number that are buying. Actually, probably significantly less. Yeah. Uh, a portion of the people who are buying this pay-per-view are going to care enough to, to collect the DVD. So don't do stuff like this. And even more. I mean, there was a there's a point here where Daniels went for that old, uh, uh, what's it called? A Pescado in a Hurricane Ronald like Petey Williams used to do. And AJ caught him and powerbombed him on the floor. And I thought, wow, that sucked. But it got a giant pop. The crowd all went, ooh. So they got that out of it. AJ took this fall on his head rolling off the apron. Half the crowd couldn't even see it because he was on the other side of the ring. And the half that did, didn't care. No. Stupid. Four and a quarter stars, four and a half stars, everybody, though. If, if um, you know, maybe when the DVD comes out at your local video store, rent it and watch this match. I uh, Angle match, like I said, good. The opener, good. But the main event was really the highlight of the show. And it's hard to, to really hate the show because the main event was so goddamn good. Oh, I have no problem hating the show. But I wish I hadn't seen, like, half of it. So. Yes.